Act One of The White Devil by John Webster. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae Lodovico, an Italian Count in Love with Isabella. Read by Martin Giesen. Antonelli, Lodovico's friend. Read by Timothy Ferguson. Gasparo, Lodovico's friend and conspirator. Read by Max Schollinger. Bracciano, husband of Isabella. Read by M. B. Vittoria Corombona, sister to Flaminio, wife to Camillo. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Flaminio, brother to Vittoria, secretary to Bracciano. Read by David Nicol. Camillo, husband to Vittoria. Read by Losh Rolander. Cornelia, mother to Vittoria, Flaminio, and Marcello. Read by Carol Box. Zanche, Moorish servant to Vittoria. Read by Lucy Perry. Francisco de' Medici, Duke of Florence, later disguised as Molinassar the Moor. Read by Bruce Perry. Isabella, sister to Francisco, wife to Bracciano. Read by Avaii. Giovanni, son to Bracciano and Isabella. Read by Ariel Lipshaw. Marcello, brother to Vittoria and Flaminio. Read by Marty Criswanis. Monticelso, a cardinal. Read by Ron Altman. Doctor and physician. Read by Algy Pug. Conjurer. Read by Timothy Ferguson. Lawyer. Read by Leonard Wilson. French Ambassador. Read by Todd. English Ambassador. Read by Algy Pug. Servant and Page. Read by Christine G. Savoy Ambassador, Armorer, Young Lord, Cardinal, and Aragon. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Matron and Woman. Read by Bev Stevens. Hortensio, an Officer. Read by Todd. Narration read by David Lawrence. Act One, Scene One. Enter Count Lodovico, Antonelli, and Gasparo. Banished! It grieved me much to hear the sentence. Ha! <laughs> oh, Democritus, thy gods that govern the whole world! Courtly reward and punishment! Fortune's a right whore! If she give aught, she deals it in small parcels, that she may take away all at one swoop. This tis to have great enemies. God quite them. Your wolf no longer seems to be a wolf than when she's hungry. You term those enemies are men of princely rank. Oh, I pray for them. The violent thunder is adored by those are pashed in pieces by it. Come, my lord, you are justly doomed. Look but a little back into your former life. You have in three years ruined the noblest earldom. Your followers have swallowed you like mummia, and being sick with such unnatural and horrid physic, vomit you up at the kennel. All the damnable degrees of drinking have you staggered through. One citizen is lord of two fair manners, called you master, only for caviar. Those noblemen which were invited to your prodigal feasts, when the phoenix scarce could scape your throats, laugh at your misery as foredeeming you an idle meteor, which drawn forth the earth will be soon lost in the air. Jest upon you and say you were begotten in an earthquake. You have ruined such fair lordships. <laughs> Very good. This well goes with two buckets. I must tend the pouring out of either. Worse than these, you have acted certain murders here in Rome, bloody and full of horror. Last they were flea-bitings. Why took they not my head then? Oh, my lord, the law doth sometimes mediate, thinks it good not ever to steep violent sins in blood. This gentle penance may both end your crimes, and in the example better these bad times. 
so but i wonder then some great men scape this banishment there's paolo giordano orsini the duke of bracciano now lives in rome and by close panderism seeks to prostitute the honour of vittoria corombona vittoria she that might have got my pardon for one kiss to the duke have a full man within you we see that trees bear no such pleasant fruit there where they grew first as where they are new set perfumes the more they are chafed the more they render their pleasing sense and so affliction expresseth virtue fully whether true or else adulterate <laughs> leave your painted comforts i'll make italian cutworks in their guts if ever i return oh sir i am patient i have seen some ready to be executed give pleasant looks and money and grown familiar with the knave hangman so do i i thank them and would account them nobly merciful would they dispatch me quickly fare you well we shall find time i doubt not to repeal your banishment i am ever bound to you this is the world's arms pray make use of it great men sell sheep thus to be cut in pieces when first they have shorn them bare and sold their fleeces exeunt scene two enter bracciano camillo flaminio vittoria your best of rest unto my lord the duke the best of welcome more lights attend the duke exeunt camillo and vittoria flaminio my lord quite lost flaminio pursue your noble wishes i am prompt as lightning to your service oh my lord the fair vittoria my happy sister shall give you present audience gentlemen let the carriage go on and tis his pleasure you put out all your torches and depart are, are we so happy can it be otherwise observed you not to-night my honoured lord which way so e'er you went she threw her eyes i have dealt already with her chambermaid zanke the moor and she is wondrous proud to be the agent for so high a spirit we are happy above thought because above merit above merit oh we may now talk freely above merit what is do you doubt her coyness that's but the superficies of lust most women have yet why should ladies blush to hear that named which they do not fear to handle oh they are politic they know our desire is increased by the difficulty of enjoying whereas satiety is a blunt weary and drowsy passion if the buttery hatch at court stood continually open there would be nothing so passionate crowding nor hot suit after the beverage oh but her jealous husband hang him a gilder that hath his brains perished with quicksilver is not more cold in the liver the great barriers moulted not more feathers than he hath shed hairs by the confession of his doctor an irish gamester that will play himself naked and then wage all downward at hazard is not more venturous so unable to please a woman that like a dutch doublet all his back is shrunk into his breeches shroud you within this closet good my lord some trick must now be thought on to divide my brother-in-law from his fair bedfellow oh should she fail to come i must not have your lordship thus unwisely amorous i myself have not loved a lady and pursued her with a great deal of underage protestation whom some three or four gallants that have enjoyed would with all their hearts have been glad to have been rid of tis just like a summer bird-cage in a garden the birds that are without despair to get in and the birds that are within despair and are in a consumption for fear they shall never get out away away my lord exit bracciano as camillo enters see here he comes this fellow by his apparel some men would judge a politician but call his wit in question you shall find it merely an ass in his footcloth how now brother 
What? Travelling to bed with your kind wife? I assure you, brother, no. My voyage lies more northerly in a far colder clime. I do not well remember, I protest, when I last lay with her. Strange you should lose your count. We never lay together, but ere morning there grew a flaw between us. It had been your part to have made up that flaw. True, but she loathes I should be seen in it. Why, sir? What's the matter? The Duke, your master, visits me. I thank him, and I perceive how, like an earnest bowler, he very passionately leans that way he should have his bowl run. I hope you do not think— That nobleman bowl booty? Faith, his cheek hath a most excellent bias. It would fain jump with my mistress. Will you be an ass, despite your Aristotle? Or a cuckold, contrary to your ephemerides, which shows you under what a smiling planet you were first swaddled? Pew view, sir, tell me not of planets, nor of ephemerides. A man may be made cuckold in the daytime, when the star's eyes are out. Sir, good-bye to you. I do commit you to your pitiful pillow stuffed with horn shavings. Brother. God refuse me. Might I advise you now, your only course, were to lock up your wife? Twere very good. Bar her the sight of revels. Excellent. Let her not go to church, but like a hound in Leon at your heels. Twere for her honour. And so, you should be certain in one fortnight, despite her chastity or innocence, to be cuckolded, which is yet in suspense. This is my counsel, and I ask no fee for it. Come, you know not where my nightcap rings me. Wear it in the old fashion. Let your large ears come through it. It will be more easy. Nay, I will be bitter. Bar your wife of her entertainment? Women are more willingly and more gloriously chaste when they are least restrained of their liberty. It seems you would be a fine, capricious, mathematically jealous coxcomb. Take the height of your own horns with a Jacob's staff afore they are up. These politic enclosures for poultry mutton makes more rebellion in the flesh than all the provocative electuaries doctors have uttered since last jubilee. This doth not physic me. It seems you are jealous. I'll show you the error of it by a familiar example. I have seen a pair of spectacles fashioned with such perspective art that lay down but one twelve pence on the board twill appear as if there were twenty. Now, should you wear a pair of these spectacles and see your wife tying her shoe, you would imagine twenty hands were taking up of your wife's clothes, and this would put you into a horrible, causeless fury. The fault there, sir, is not in the eyesight. True, but they that have the yellow jaundice think all objects they look on to be yellow. Jealousy is worse. Her fits present to a man like so many bubbles in a basin of water, twenty several crabbed faces, many times makes his own shadow his cuckold maker. Enter Vittoria Corombona. See, she comes. What reason have you to be jealous of this creature? What an ignorant ass or flattering knave might be counted that should write sonnets to her eyes, or call her brow the snow of Ida or ivory of Corinth? or compare her hair to the blackbird's bill, when tis liker the blackbird's feather. <laughs> this is all. Be wise. I will make you friends, and you shall go to bed together. Now, look you, it shall not be your seeking. Do you stand upon that by any means? Walk you aloof. I would not have you seen it. Sister! My lord, attend you in the banqueting-house. Your husband is wondrous discontented. I did nothing to displease him. I carved to him at supper-time. You need not have carved him, i'faith. They say he is a capon already. I must now seemingly fall out with you. Shall a gentleman so well descended as Camillo, a lousy slave that within this twenty years rode with the blackguard in the duke's carriage amongst spits and dripping pants? Now he begins to tickle her. An excellent scholar, one that hath a head filled with calves' brains without any sage in them come crouching in the hams to you for a light's lodging. 
that hath an itch in his hands which like the fire at the glass-house has not gone out this seven years is he not a courtly gentleman when he wears white satin one would take him by his black muzzle to be no other creature than a maggot you are a goodly foil i confess well set out but covered with a false stone yon counterfeit diamond he will make her know what's in me come my lord attends you thou shalt go to bed to my lord now he comes to it to camillo i am opening your case hard a virtuous brother o my credit he will give thee a ring with a philosopher's stone in it indeed i am studying alchemy thou shalt lie in a bed stuffed with turtle's feathers swoon in perfumed linen like the fellow was smothered in roses so perfect shall be thy happiness that as men at sea think land and trees and ships go that way they go so both heaven and earth shall seem to go your voyage shalt meet him tis fixed with nails of diamonds to inevitable necessity how shalt rid him hence i will put brise in his tail set him gadding presently i have almost wrought her to it i find her coming but might i advise you now for this night i would not lie with her i would cross her humour to make her more humble shall i shall i it will show you in a supremacy of judgment true and a mind differing from the tumultuary opinion for quae negata grata right you are the adamant shall draw her to you though you keep distance off a philosophical reason walk by her in the nobleman's fashion and tell her you will lie with her at the end of the progress vittoria i cannot be induced or as a man would say incited to do what sir to lie with you to-night your silkworm used to fast every third day and the next following spins the better to-morrow at night i'm for you you'll spin a fair thread trust to it but do you hear i shall have you steal to her chamber about midnight do you think so why look you brother because you shall not say i'll gull you take the key lock me into the chamber and say you shall be sure of me in truth i will i'll be your jailer once a pox won't as i am a christian tell me to-morrow how scurvily she takes my unkind parting i will didst thou not mark the jest of the silkworm good night in faith i will use this trick often do 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 exit camillo so now you are safe ha 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 thou entanglest thyself in thine own work like a silkworm enter bracciano come sister darkness hides your blush women are like cursed dogs civility keeps them tied all daytime but they are let loose at midnight then they do most good or most mischief my lord my lord zanche brings out a carpet spreads it and lays on it two fair cushions enter cornelia listening but unperceived give credit i wish time would stand still and never end this interview this hour but all delight doth itself soon devour let me into your bosom happy lady pour out instead of eloquence my vows loose me not madam for if you forego me i am lost eternally sir in the way of pity i wish you heart whole you are a sweet physician sure sir a loathed cruelty in ladies is as to doctors many funerals it takes away their credit excellent creature well, we call the cruel fair what name for you that are so merciful see now they close most happy union aside my fears are fallen upon me o oh, my heart my son the panda now i find our house sinking to ruin earthquakes leave behind where they have tyrannized iron or lead or stone but woe to ruin violent lust leaves none uh, what value is this jewel tis the ornament of a weak fortune in in sooth uh, i'll have it nay i i will but change my jewel for uh, your jewel excellent his jewel for her jewel well put in duke 
Nay, let me see you wear it. Here, sir? <laughs> Nay, lower. I shall wear my jewel lower. That's better. She must wear his jewel lower. To pass away the time, I'll tell your grace a dream I had last night. Most wishedly. A foolish, idle dream. Methought I walked about the mid of night into a churchyard, where a goodly yew-tree spread her large root in ground. Under that yew, as I sat sadly leaning on a grave checkered with cross-sticks, there came stealing in your duchess and my husband. One of them a pickaxe bore, the other a rusty spade, and in rough terms they gan to challenge me about this yew. That tree? This harmless yew. They told me my intent was to root up that well-grown yew, and plant to the stead of it a withered blackthorn, and for that they vowed to bury me alive. My husband straight with pickaxe gan to dig, and your fell duchess with shovel like a fury voided out the earth and scattered bones. Lord, how methought I trembled, and yet for all this terror I could not pray. No, the devil was in your dream. When to my rescue there arose methought a whirlwind, which let fall a massy arm from that strong plant, and both were struck dead by that sacred yew, into that base, shallow grave that was their due. Excellent devil! She hath taught him in a dream to make away his duchess and her husband. Mm -hmm. Sweetly shall I interpret this your dream. You are lodged within his arms who shall protect you from all the fevers of a jealous husband, from the poor envy of our phlegmatic duchess. I'll seat you above law and above scandal, give to your thoughts the invention of delight and the fruition. Nor shall government divide me from you longer than a care to keep you great. You shall to me at once be dukedom, health, wife, children, friends, and all. Advancing. Woe to light hearts. They still fore on our fall. What fury raised thee up? Away, away! Exit, Zanche. What make you here, my lord, this dead of night? Never dropped mildew on a flower here till now. I pray, will you go to bed then, lest you be blasted? Oh, that this fair garden had with all poison herbs of Thessaly at first been planted, made a nursery for witchcraft, rather than a burial plot for both your honours. Dearest mother, hear me. Oh, thou dost make my brow bend to the earth, sooner than nature. See the curse of children. In life they keep us frequently in tears, and in the cold grave leave us in pale fears. Oh, come, come, I will not hear you. Dear my lord. Where is thy duchess now, adulterous duke? Thou little dream'st this night she's come to Rome. How? Come to Rome? The duchess. She had been better. The lives of princes should like dials move, whose regular example is so strong, they make the times by them go right or wrong. So, have you done? Unfortunate Camillo. I do protest, if any chaste denial, if anything but blood could have allayed his long suit to me. I will join with thee, to the most woeful end ere mother kneeled. If thou dishonour thus thy husband's bed, be thy life short as are the funeral tears in great men's. Fie, fie, the woman's mad! Be thy act Judas-like, betray in kissing. Mayst thou be envied during his short breath, and pitied like a wretch after his death. O oh, me, accursed! Exit. Are you out of your wits? My lord, I'll fetch her back again. No, I'll to bed. Send Dr. Julio to me presently. Uncharitable woman! Thy rash tongue hath raised a fearful and prodigious storm. Be thou the cause of all ensuing harm. Exit. Now, you that stand so much upon your honour, is this a fitting time of night, think you, to send a duke home without e'er a man? I would fain know where lies the mass of wealth which you have hoarded for my maintenance, that I may bear my beard out of the level of my lord's stirrup. What? Because we are poor, shall we be vicious? Pray, 
What means have you to keep me from the galleys or the gallows? My father proved himself a gentleman, sold all his land, and, like a fortunate fellow, died ere the money was spent. You brought me up at Padua, I confess, where, I protest, for want of means, the university judge me, I have been fain to heal my tutor's stockings at least seven years. Conspiring with a beard made me a graduate. Then, to this duke's service, I visited the court, whence I returned more courteous, more lecherous by far, but not as suit the richer. And shall I, having a path so open and so free to my preferment, still retain your milk in my pale forehead? No, this face of mine I'll arm and fortify with lusty wine gainst shame and blushing. Oh, that I ne'er had borne thee. So would I. I would the commonest courtesan in Rome had been my mother rather than thyself. Nature is very pitiful to whores, to give them but few children, yet those children plurality of fathers. They are sure they shall not want. Go, go, complain unto my great lord cardinal. It may be he will justify the act. Lycurgus wondered much men would provide good stallions for their mares, and yet would suffer their fair wives to be barren. Misery of miseries. Exit. The Duchess come to court. I like not that. We are engaged to mischief, and must on. As rivers to find out the ocean flow with crook bendings beneath forced banks, or as we see to aspire some mountain's top, the way ascends not straight, but imitates the subtle foldings of a winter's snake. So who knows policy and her true aspect shall find her ways winding and indirect. End of Act One Act Two of The White Devil by John Webster This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One Enter Francisco de Medici, Cardinal Montecelso, Marcello, Isabella, young Giovanni, with little Jacques the Moor. Have you not seen your husband since you arrived? Not yet, sir. Surely he is wondrous kind. If I had such a dove house as Camillo's, I would set fire on it were it but to destroy the pole cats that haunt to it. My sweet cousin. Lord Uncle, you did promise me a horse and armor. That I did, my pretty cousin. Marcello, see it fitted. My lord, the duke is here. Sister, away. You must not yet be seen. I do beseech you, entreat him mildly. Let not your rough tongue set us at louder variance. All my wrongs are freely pardoned, and I do not doubt, as man, to try the precious unicorn's horn, make of the powder a preservative circle, and in it put a spider, so these arms shall charm his poison, force it to obeying, and keep him chased from an infected straying. I wish it may. Be gone. Exit Isabella, as Bracciano and Flaminio enter. Void the chamber. You are welcome. Will you sit? I pray, my lord, be you my orator, my heart's too full. I'll second you anon. Ere I begin, let me entreat your grace, forgo all passion, which may be raised by my free discourse. As silent as in the church, you may proceed. It is a wonder to your noble friends that you, having as twere entered the world with a free sceptre in your able hand, and having to the use of nature well applied high gifts of learning, should in your prime age neglect your awful throne for the soft down of an insatiate bed. O oh, my lord, the drunkard, after all his lavish cups is dry, and then is sober, so at length when you awake from this lascivious dream, repentance then will follow, like the sting placed in the adder's tail. Wretched are princes when fortune blasteth but a petty flower of their unwieldy crowns, 
or ravisheth but one pearl from their sceptre. But alas, when they to wilful shipwreck lose good fame, all princely titles perish with their name. You have said, my lord, enough to give you taste how far I am from flattering your greatness. Now you that are his second, what say you? Do not like young hawks fetch a course about, your game flies fair and for you. Do not fear it. I'll answer you in your own hawking phrase. Some eagles that should gaze upon the sun seldom soar high but take their lustful ease since they from dunghill birds their prey can seize. You know Vittoria? Yes. You shift your shirt there when you retire from tennis? Happily. Her husband is lord of a poor fortune, yet she wears cloth of tissue. Well, what of this? Will you urge that, my good lord cardinal, as part of her confession at next shrift, and know from whence it sails? She is your strumpet. Uncivil, sir, there's hemlock in thy breath, and that black slander. Were she a whore of mine, all thy loud cannons and thy borrowed switzers, thy galleys nor thy sworn confederates durst not supplant her. Let's not talk on thunder. Thou hast a wife, our sister. Would I had given both her white hands to death, bound and locked fast in her last winding-sheet, when I gave thee but one. Thou hadst given a soul to God, then. True. Thy ghostly father, with all his absolution, shall ne'er do so by thee. A spit thy poison! I shall not need. Lust carries her sharp whip at her own girdle. Look to it, for our anger is making thunderbolts. Thunder? In faith they are but crackers. We'll end this with the cannon. Thou get not by it but iron in thy wounds, and gunpowder in thy nostrils. Better that than change perfumes for plasters. Pity on thee. Twere good you'd show your slaves or men condemned your new ploughed forehead. Defiance! And I'll meet thee, even in a thicket of thy ablest men. My lords, you shall not word it any further without a milder limit. Willingly. Have you proclaimed a triumph that you bait a lion thus? My lord! I am tame, I am tame, sir. We send unto the duke for conference about levies gainst the pirates. My lord duke is not at home. We come ourself in person. Still, my lord duke is busied. But we fear when Tiber to each prowling passenger discovers flocks of wild ducks. Then, my lord, bout molting time, I mean, we shall be certain to find you sure enough and speak with you. Ha! A mere tale of a tub, my words are idle. But to express the sonnet by natural reason, when stags grow melancholic, you'll find the season. Enter Giovanni. No more, my lord. Here comes a champion shall end the difference between you both. Your son, the Prince Giovanni. See, my lords, what hopes you store in him. This is a casket for both your crowns, and should be held like dear. Now is he apt for knowledge. Therefore know it is a more direct and even way to train to virtue those of princely blood by examples than by precepts. If by examples, whom should he rather strive to imitate than his own father? Be his pattern, then. Leave him a stock of virtue that may last, should fortune rend his sails and split his mast. <laughs> Your hand, boy. Growing to a soldier, eh? Give me a pike. What, practicing your pike so young, fair cousin? Suppose me one of Homer's frogs, my lord, tossing my bulrush thus. Pray, sir, tell me, might not a child of good discretion be leader to an army? Yes, cousin, a young prince of good discretion might. Say you so? Indeed, I have heard, tis fit a general should not endanger his own person oft, so that he make a noise when he's a horseback like a dansky drummer. Oh, tis excellent! He need not fight. Methinks his horse as well might lead an army for him. If I live, I'll charge the French foe in the very front of all my troops, the foremost man. 
What? What? And will not bid my soldiers up and follow, but bid them follow me. Forward, Lapwing. He flies with the shell on his head. Pretty cousin. The first year, uncle, that I go to war, all prisoners that I take I will set free without their ransom. Ha! Huh, without their ransom? How then will you reward your soldiers that took those prisoners for you? Thus, my lord, I'll marry them to all the wealthy widows that falls that year. Why, then, the next year following you'll have no men to go with you to war. Why, then, I'll press the women to the war, and then the men will follow. O oh, witty prince! See, a good habit makes a child a man, whereas a bad one makes a man a beast. Come, you and I are friends. Most wishedly. Like bones which, broken sunder and well set, knit the more strongly. Call Camillo hither. You have received the rumour how Count Lodowick is turned a pirate? Yes. We are now preparing to fetch him in. Behold, your Duchess. We now will leave you, and expect from you nothing but kind entreaty. You have charmed me. Exeunt, Francisco, Monticelso, and Giovanni. Enter Isabella. You are in health, we see. And above health, to see my lord well. So, I wonder much what amorous whirlwind hurried you to Rome. Devotion, my lord. Devotion? Is your soul charged with any grievous sin? Tis burdened with too many, and I think the oftener that we cast our reckonings up, our sleep will be the sounder. Take your chamber! Nay, my dear lord, I will not have you angry. Doth not my absence from you, now two months, merit one kiss? I do not use to kiss, but if that will dispossess your jealousy, I'll swear it to you. Oh, my loved lord, I do not come to chide. My jealousy, I am to learn what that Italian means. You are as welcome to these longing arms as I to you, a virgin. Oh, your breath! Out upon sweetmeats and continued physic, the plague is in them. You have oft for those two lips neglected cassia or the natural sweets of the spring violet. They are not yet much withered. My lord, I should be merry. These your frowns show in a helmet lovely, but on me, in such a peaceful interview, methinks they are too roughly knit. Oh, dissemblance! Do you bandy factions against me? Have you learnt the trick of impudent baseness to complain unto your kindred? Never, my dear lord. Must I be hunted out? Or was your trick to meet some amorous gallant here in Rome that must supply our discontinuance? Pray, sir, burst my heart, and in my death turn to your ancient pity, though not love. Because your brother is the corpulent duke, that is, the great duke, Steth, I shall not shortly racket away five hundred crowns at tennis, but it shall rest upon record. I scorn him like a shaved Polack. All his reverend wit lies in his wardrobe. He's a discreet fellow when he's made up in his robes of state. Your brother, the great duke, because has galleys and now and then ransacks a Turkish flyboat. Now all the hellish furies take his soul. First made this match. Accursed be the priest that sang the wedding mass, and even my issue. Oh, too, too far you have cursed. Your hand I'll kiss. This is the latest ceremony of my love. Henceforth I'll never lie with thee. By this, this wedding rig I'll never lie with thee. And this divorce shall be as truly kept as if the judge had doomed it. Fare ye well. Our sleeps are severed. Forbid it the sweet union of all things blessed. Why, the saints in heaven will knit their brows at that. Let not thy love make thee an unbeliever. This my vow shall never on my soul be satisfied with my repentance. Let thy brother rage beyond a horrid tempest or sea fight. My vow is fixed. Oh, my winding sheet, now shall I need thee shortly. Dear my lord, let me hear once more what I would not hear. Never? Never. Oh, my unkind lord, may your sins find mercy, as I upon a woeful widowed bed shall pray for you, 
if not to turn your eyes upon your wretched wife and hopeful son, yet that in time you'll fix them upon heaven. No more! Go, go, complain to the great duke! No, my dear lord, you shall have present witness how I'll work peace between you. I will make myself the author of your cursed vow. I have some cause to do it, you have none. Conceal it, I beseech you, for the weal of both your dukedoms, that you wrought the means of such a separation. Let the fault remain with my supposed jealousy, and think with what a piteous and rent heart I shall perform this sad ensuing part. Enter Francisco, Flaminio, Montecelso, and Camillo. Well, take your course, my honorable brother. Sister, this is not well, my lord. Why, sister, she merits not this welcome. Welcome, say? She hath given a sharp welcome. Are you foolish? Come, dry your tears. Is this a modest course to better what is not? To rail and weep? Grow to a reconcilement, or by heaven, I'll ne'er more deal between you. Sir, you shall not. No, though Victoria, upon that condition, would become honest. Was your husband loud since we departed? By my life, sir, no. I swear by that I do not care to lose. Are all these ruins of my former beauty laid out for a whore's triumph? Do you hear? Look upon other women, with what patience they suffer these slight wrongs, and with what justice they study to requite them. Take that course. Oh, that I were a man, or that I had power to execute my apprehended wishes. I would whip some with scorpions. What? Turned fury? To dig that strumpet's eyes out, let her lie some twenty months a-dying, to cut off her nose and lips, pull out her rotten teeth, preserve her flesh like mummia for trophies of my just anger. Hell to my affliction is me a snow-water. By your favour, sir. Brother, draw near, and my lord cardinal. Sir, let me borrow of you but one kiss. Henceforth I'll never lie with you by this, this wedding ring. How? Ne'er more lie with him. And this divorce shall be as truly kept as if in thronged court a thousand ears had heard it, and a thousand lawyers' hands sealed to the separation. Ne'er lie with me? Let not my former dotage make thee an unbeliever. This my vow shall never on my soul be satisfied with my repentance. Manet altamente repostum. Now, by my birth, you are a foolish, mad, and jealous woman. You see, tis not my seeking. Was this your circle of pure unicorn's horn, you said should charm your lord? Now, horns upon thee, for jealousy deserves them. Keep your vow and take your chamber. No, sir, I'll presently to Padua. I will not stay a minute. Oh, good madam. Twere best to let her have her humour. Some half-day's journey will bring down her stomach, and then she'll turn in post. To see her come to my lord for a dispensation of her rash vow will beget excellent laughter. Unkindness, do thy office. Poor heart, break. Those are the killing griefs which dare not speak. Exit. Camillo's come, my lord. Enter Camillo. Where's the commission? Tis here. Give me the signet. Leading Bracciano aside. My lord, do you mark their whispering? I will compound a medicine out of their two heads, stronger than garlic, deadlier than stibium. The cantharides, which are scarce seen to stick upon the flesh when they work to the heart, shall not do it with more silence or invisible cunning. Enter doctor. About the murder? They are sending him to Naples, but I'll send him to Candy. Here's another property, too. Oh, the doctor. A poor quack-salving knave, my lord, one that should have been lashed for his lechery, but that he confessed a judgment, had an execution laid upon him, and so put the whip to a nonplus. And was cozened, my lord, by an arranter knave than myself, and made pay all the colourable execution. He will shoot pills into a man's guts, shall make them have more vintages than a cornet or a lamprey. He will poison a kiss, and was once minded for his masterpiece, 
because Ireland breeds no poison, to have prepared a deadly vapour in a Spaniard's fart that should have poisoned all Dublin. Oh, St. Anthony's fire! Your secretary is merry, my lord. O oh, thou cursed antipathy to nature! Look, his eyes bloodshot like a needle a surgeon stitcheth a wound with. Let me embrace thee, toad, and love thee, O oh, thou abominable, loathsome gargarism, that will fetch up lungs, lights, heart, and liver by scruples. No more. I must employ thee, honest doctor. You must to Padua, and by the way use some of your skill for us. Sir, I shall. But for Camillo? He dies this night. By such a politic strain men shall suppose him by his own engine slain. But for your duchess's death. I'll make her sure. Small mischiefs are by greater made secure. Remember this, you slave. When knaves come to preferment, they rise as gallows in the low countries, upon one another's shoulders. Exeunt. Monticelso, Camillo, and Francisco come forward. Here is an emblem, nephew. Pray peruse it. Twas thrown in at your window. At my window? Here's a stag, my lord, hath shed his horns, and for the loss of them the poor beast weeps. The word in open me copia ficit. That is, plenty of horns hath made him poor of horns. What should this mean? I'll tell you. Tis given out you are a cuckold. Is it given out so? I had rather such reports as that, my lord, should keep within doors. Have you any children? None, my lord. You are the happier. I'll tell you a tale. Pray, my lord. An old tale. Upon a time Phoebus, the god of light, or him we call the sun, would need to be married. The gods gave their consent, and Mercury was sent to voice it to the general world. But what a piteous cry there straight arose amongst smiths and felt-makers, brewers and cooks, reapers and butter-women, amongst fishmongers and thousand other trades, which are annoyed by his excessive heat. T'was lamentable. They came to Jupiter all in a sweat, and do forbid the bands. A great fat cook was made their speaker, who entreats of Jove that Phoebus might be gelded for if now when there was but one sun so many men were like to perish by his violent heat what should they do if he were married and should beget more and those children make fireworks like their father so say i only i apply it to your wife her issue should not providence prevent it would make both nature time and man repent it look you cousin Go, change the air for shame. See if your absence will blast your cornucopia. Marcello is chosen with you joint commissioner for the relieving our Italian coast from pirates. I am much honored in it. But, sir, ere I return, the stag's horns may be sprouted greater than those are shed. Do not fear it. I'll be your ranger. You must watch it in the nights, then's the most danger. Farewell, good Marcello. All the best fortunes of a soldier's wish bring you a shipboard. Were I not best, now I'm turned soldier. Ere that I leave my wife, sell all she hath, and then take leave of her? I expect good from you. Your parting is so merry. Merry, my lord. Ah, the captain's humour right. I'm resolved to be drunk this night. Exeunt. So twas well fitted. Now shall we discern how his wished absence will give violent way to Duke Bracciano's lust. Why, that was it. To what scorned purpose else should we make choice of him for a sea captain? And besides, Count Lodovic, which was rumoured for a pirate, is now in Padua. Is it true? Most certain. I have letters from him which are suppliant to work his quick repeal from banishment. 
He means to address himself for pension unto our sister Duchess. Oh, twas well. We shall not want his absence past six days. I fain would have the Duke Bracciano run into notorious scandal, for there's not in such cursed dotage to repair his name only the deep sense of some deathless shame. It may be objected. I am dishonorable to play thus with my kinsmen. But I answer, for my revenge I'd take a brother's life that being wronged durst not avenge himself. Come, to observe this strumpet. Curse of greatness! Sure he'll not leave her? There's small pity in it. Like mistletoe on sere elms spent by weather, let him cleave to her and both rot together. Exeunt. Scene two. Enter Bracciano with one in the habit of a conjurer. Now, sir, I claim your promise. Tis dead midnight, the time prefixed to show me by your art how the intended murder of Camillo and our loathed Duchess grow to action. You have won me by your bounty to a deed I do not often practice. Some there are which by sophistic tricks aspire that name which I would gladly lose of necromancer. As some that used to juggle upon cards seeming to conjure, when indeed they cheat, Others that raise up their confederate spirits about windmills and endanger their own necks for making of a squib. And some there are will keep a kirtle to show juggling tricks and give out tis a spirit. Besides these, such a whole ream of almanac makers, figure flingers, fellows, indeed, that live only by stealth, since they do merely lie about stolen goods. They'd make men think the devil were fast and loose with speaking fustian Latin. Pray sit down. Put on this nightcap, sir. Tis charmed. And now I'll show you by my strong commanding art the circumstance that breaks your duchess heart. A dumb show. Enter suspiciously Julio and Cristofero. They draw a curtain where Branciano's picture is. They put on spectacles of glass which cover their eyes and noses, and then burn perfumes before the picture, and wash the lips of the picture. That done, quenching the fire and putting off their spectacles, they depart laughing. Enter Isabella in her nightgown, as to bedward. With lights, after her, Count Levitico, Giovanni, Guidantonio, and others waiting on her. She kneels down as to prayers, then draws the curtain of the picture does three reverences to it, and kisses it thrice. She faints, and will not suffer them to come near it, dies. Sorrow expressed in Giovanni and in Count Lodovico. She is conveyed out solemnly. Excellent! Then she's dead. She is poisoned by the fumed picture. Twas her custom nightly, before she went to bed, to go and visit your picture, and to feed her eyes and lips on the dead shadow. Dr. Julio, observing this, infects it with an oil and other poisoned stuff, which presently did suffocate her spirits. Methought I saw Count Lodowick there. He was, and by my art I find he did most passionately dote upon your duchess. Now turn another way and view Camelot's far more politic fate. Strike louder music from this charmed ground to yield, as fits the act, a tragic sound. Second dumb show. Enter Flaminio, Marcello, Camillo, with four more as captains. They drink healths and dance. A vaulting horse is brought into the room. Marcello and two more whispered out of the room, while Flaminio and Camillo strip themselves into their shirts as to vault. Compliment who shall begin. As Camillo is about to vault, Flaminio pitcheth him upon his neck, and, with the help of the rest, rise his neck about, seems to see if it be broke, and lays him full the double, as twere under the horse. Makes show to call for help. Marcello comes in, laments, sends for the cardinal and duke, who come forth with armed men. Wonders at the act, commands the body to be carried home, 
apprehends Flaminio, Marcello, and the rest, and go, as twere to apprehend Vittoria. "'Twas quaintly done, but yet each circumstance I taste not fully. Oh, twas most apparent. You saw them enter, charged with their deep healths, to their boon voyage, and, to second that, Flaminio calls to have a vaulting horse maintain their sport. The virtuous Marcello is innocently plotted forth the room, whilst your eye saw the rest, and can inform you the engine of all. It seems Marcello and Flaminio are both committed. Yes, you saw them guarded. And now they are come with purpose to apprehend your mistress, fair Vittoria. We are now beneath her roof. T'were fit we instantly make out by some back postern. Noble friend, you bind me ever to you. This shall stand as the firm seal annexed to my hand. It shall enforce a payment. Exit Branciano. Sir, I thank you. Both flowers and weeds spring when the sun is warm. And great men do great good, or else great harm. Exit. End of Act Two. Act Three of The White Devil by John Webster. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One. Enter Francesco de' Medici and Montecelso, their chancellor and register. You have dealt discreetly to obtain the presence of all the great leisure ambassadors to hear Vittoria's trial. Twas not ill, for, sir, you know we have naught but circumstances to charge her with about her husband's death. Their approbation, therefore, to the proofs of her black lust shall make her infamous to all our neighboring kingdoms. I wonder if Bracciano will be here. Oh, fie, t'were impudence too palpable. Exeunt. Enter Flaminio and Marcello guarded, and a lawyer. What? Are you in by the week? So, I will try now whether thy wit be close prisoner. Methinks none should sit upon thy sister but old whore-masters. Or cuckolds, for your cuckold is your most terrible tickler of lechery. Whore-masters would serve, for none are judges at tilting but those that have been old tilters. My lord duke and she have been very private. <laughs> You're a dull ass. Tis threatened they have been very public. If it can be proved they have but kissed one another. What then? My lord cardinal will ferret them. A cardinal, I hope, will not catch conies. For to sow kisses, mark what I say, to sow kisses is to reap lechery. And I am sure a woman that will endure kissing is half one. True. Her upper part, by that rule. If you will win her nether part too, you know what follows. Hark, the ambassadors are lighted. I do put on this feigned garb of mirth to gull suspicion. O oh, my unfortunate sister, I would my dagger point had cleft her heart when she first saw Bracciano. You, tis said, were made his engine and his stalking horse to undo my sister. I am a kind of path to her and mine own preferment. Your ruin. Hm. Thou art a soldier, followest the great duke, feedst his victories, as witches do their serviceable spirits, even with thy prodigal blood. What hast got? But, like the wealth of captains, a poor handful, which in thy palm thou bearest as men hold water, Seeking to grip it fast, the frail reward steals through thy fingers. Sir! Thou hast scarce maintenance to keep thee in fresh chamois. Hear me! And thus, when we have even poured ourselves into great fights for their ambition or idle spleen, how shall we find reward? But as we seldom find the mistletoe, sacred to physic on the builder oak, without a mandrake by it, so, 
in our quest of gain, alas, the poorest of their forced dislikes at a limb proffers, but at heart it strikes. This is lamented doctrine. Come, come. When age shall turn thee white as a blooming hawthorn. I'll interrupt you. For love of virtue bear an honest heart, and stride o'er every politic respect, which, where they most advance, they most infect. Were I your father, as I am your brother, I should not be ambitious to leave you a better patrimony. I'll think on't. Enter Savoy Ambassador. <gasps> the Lord Ambassadors! Here there is a passage of the Lege Ambassadors over the stage severally. Enter French Ambassador. Oh, my sprightly Frenchman! Do you know him? He's an admirable tilter. I saw him at last tilting. He showed like a pewter candlestick fashioned like a man in armour, holding a tilting staff in his hand, little bigger than a candle of twelve with a pound. Oh, but he's an excellent horseman. A lame one in his lofty tricks. He sleeps a horseback like a poulterer. Enter English and Spanish. Lo you, my Spaniard! He carried his face in his ruff as I have seen a serving man carry glasses in a cypress hat-band, <laughs> monstrous steady for fear of breaking. He looks like the claw of a blackbird, first salted and then broiled in a candle. Exeunt. Scene 2. The Arraignment of Vittoria. Enter Francisco Montecelso, the six Leger ambassadors, Franciano, Vittoria, Zanche, Flaminio, Marcello, Lawyer, and a guard. Forbear, my lord. Here is no place assigned you. This business by his holiness is left to our examination. May it thrive with you. Lays a rich gown under him. A chair there for his lordship. Forbear your kindness. An unbidden guest should travel as Dutch women go to church. Bear their stools with them. At your pleasure, sir. Stand to the table, gentlewoman. Now, signor, fall to your plea. Domine Udex, converte oculos in hanc pestem, mulierum corruptissimam. What's he? A lawyer that pleads against you. Pray, my lord, let him speak his usual tongue. I'll make no answer else. Why, you understand Latin. I do, sir. But amongst this auditory which come to hear my cause, the half or more may be ignorant in't. Go on, sir. By your favour I will not have my accusation clouded in a strange tongue. All this assembly shall hear what you can charge me with. Signor, you need not stand on it much. Pray, change your language. Oh, for God's sake! Gentlewoman, your credit shall be more famous by it. Well, then, have at you. I am at the mark, sir. I'll give aim to you and tell you how near you shoot. Most literated judges, please your lordships so to connive your judgments to the view of this debauched and diversivolent woman, who such a black concatenation of mischief hath effected that to extirp the memory of it must be the consummation of her and her projections what's all this hold your peace exorbitant sins must have exulceration surely my lords this lawyer here hath swallowed some apothecary's bills or proclamations and now the hard and undigestible words come up like stones we use give hawks for physic. Why, this is Welsh to Latin. My lords, the woman knows not her tropes nor figures, nor is perfect in the academic derivation of grammatical elocution. Sir, your pains shall be well spared, and your deep eloquence be worthily applauded amongst those which understand you. My good lord. Sir, put up your papers in your fustian bag. Francisco speaks this as in scorn. Cry mercy, sir, tis buckram, and accept my notion of your learned verbosity. I most graduatically thank your lordship. I shall have use for them elsewhere. I shall be plainer with you, 
and paint out your follies in more natural red and white than that upon your cheek. Oh, you mistake! You raise a blood as noble in this cheek as ever was your mother's. I must spare you, till proof cry whore to that. Observe this creature here, my honoured lords, a woman of most prodigious spirit in her affected. My honourable lord, it doth not suit a reverend cardinal to play the lawyer thus. Oh, your trade instructs your language. You see, my lords, what goodly fruit she seems. Yet, like those apples travellers report to grow, where Sodom and Gomorrah stood, I will but touch her, and you straight shall see she'll fall to soot and ashes. Your envenomed pothecary should do it. I am resolved. Were there a second paradise to lose, this devil would betray it. O oh, poor charity, thou art seldom found in scarlet. Who knows not how, when several night by night her gates were choked with coaches, and her rooms outbraved the stars with several kind of lights, when she did counterfeit a prince's court and music banquets and most riotous surfeits. This whore, forsooth, was holy. Ha! Whore? What's that? Shall I expound whore to you? Sure I shall. I'll give their perfect character. They are first sweetmeats which rot the eater in man's nostrils poisoned perfumes. They are cozening alchemy, shipwrecks in calmest weather. What are whores, cold Russian winters that appear so barren as if that nature had forgot the spring? They are the true material fire of hell, worse than those tributes i the low countries paid. Exactions upon meat, drink, garments, sleep, ay, even on man's perdition, his sin. They are those brittle evidences of law, which forfeit all a wretched man's estate for leaving out one syllable. What are whores? They are those flattering bells have all one tune at weddings and at funerals. Your rich whores are only treasuries, by extortion filled, and emptied by cursed riot. They are worse, worse than dead bodies, which are begged at gallows, and wrought upon by surgeons, to teach man wherein he is imperfect. What's a whore? She's like the guilty counterfeited coin, which whosoever first stamps it brings in trouble all that receive it. This character scapes me. You, gentlewoman, take from all beasts and from all minerals their deadly poison. Well, what then? I'll tell thee. I'll find in thee apothecary's shop to sample them all. She hath lived ill. True, but the cardinal's too bitter. You know what whore is. Next the devil adultery enters the devil murder. Your unhappy husband is dead. Oh, he's a happy husband. Now he owes nature nothing. And by a vaulting engine. An active plot. He jumped into his grave. What a prodigy was it that from some two yards height a slender man should break his neck. In the rushes! And, what's more, upon the instant lose all use of speech, all vital motion, like a man had lain wound up three days. Now mark each circumstance. And look upon this creature was his wife. She comes not like a widow. She comes armed with scorn and impudence. Is this a mourning habit? Had I foreknown his death, as you suggest, I would have bespoke my mourning. Oh, you are cunning. You shame your wit and judgment to call it so. What is my just defence by him that is my judge called impudence? Let me appeal then from this Christian court to the uncivil Tartar. 
See, my lords, she scandals our proceedings. Humbly thus, thus low to the most worthy and respected lieger ambassadors, my modesty and womanhood I tender. But withal so entangled in a cursed accusation, that my defence of force like Perseus must personate masculine virtue. To the point. Find me but guilty, sever head from body, will part good friends. I scorn to hold my life at yours or any man's entreaty, sir. She hath a brave spirit. Well, well, such counterfeit jewels make true ones oft suspected. You are deceived. For know that all your strict combined heads which strike against this mine of diamonds shall prove but glass and hammers. They shall break. These are but feigned shadows of my evils. Terrify babes, my lords, with painted devils. I am past such needless palsy. For your names of whore and murderess, they proceed from you as if a man should spit against the wind. The filth returns in space. Pray you, mistress, satisfy me one question. Who lodged beneath your roof that fatal night your husband broke his neck? That question enforceth me break silence. I was there. Your business? Why, I came to comfort her and take some course for settling her estate. Because I heard her husband was in debt to you, my lord. He was. And t'was strangely feared that you would cousin her. Who made you overseer? Why, my charity, my charity, which should flow from every generous and noble spirit, to orphans and to widows. Your lust. <laughs> Cowardly dogs bark loudest. Sir, a priest, I'll talk with you hereafter, do you hear? The sword you frame of such an excellent temper I'll sheathe in your own bowels. There are a number of thy coat resemble your common post-boys. Ha! Huh. Your mercenary post-boys. Your letters carry truth, but tis your guise to fill your mouths with gross and impudent lies. My lord, your gown. Thou liest, t'was my stool, bestowed upon thy master. That will challenge the rest of the household stuff, for Bracciano was ne'er so beggarly to take a stool out of another's lodging. Let him make valance on his bed for it, or a demi footcloth for his most reverend moil. Monticelso nemo meum tune lacessit. Exit. Your champion's gone. The wolf may pray the better. My lord, there's great suspicion of the murder, but no sound proof who did it. For my part, I do not think she hath a soul so black to act a deed so bloody. If she have, as in cold countries husbandmen plant vines and with warm blood manure them, even so one summer she will bear unsavory fruit, and ere next spring wither both branch and root. The act of blood, let pass, only descend to matters of incontinence. I discern poison under your gilded pills. Now the duke's gone, I will produce a letter wherein twas plotted he and you should meet at an apothecary's summer-house, down by the river Tiber. View it, my lords, where after wanton bathing and the heat of a lascivious banquet, I pray read it. I shame to speak the rest. Grant I was tempted. Temptation to lust proves not the act. Casta est quam nemo rogavit. You read his hot love to me, but you want my frosty answer. Frost in the dog days. Strange. Condemn you me for that the duke did love me? So may you blame some fair and crystal river for that some melancholic distracted man hath drowned himself in. T. Truly drowned, indeed. Sum up my faults, I pray, and you shall find, that beauty and gay clothes, a merry heart, and a good stomach to feast, are all, all the poor crimes that you can charge me with. In faith, my lord, you might go pistol-flies, the sport would be more noble. Very good. But take your course. It seems you've beggared me first, and now would fain undo me. I have houses, jewels, and a poor remnant of crusados. Would those would make you charitable? 
If the devil did ever take good shape, behold his picture. You have one virtue left. You will not flatter me. Who brought this letter? I am not compelled to tell you. My lord duke sent to you a thousand ducats the twelfth of August. Twas to keep your cousin from prison. I paid use for it. I rather think twas interest for his lust. Who says so but yourself? If you be my accuser, pray cease to be my judge. Come from the bench, give in your evidence against me, and let these be moderators. My lord cardinal, were your intelligencing ears as loving as to my thoughts, had you an honest tongue, I would not care, though you proclaimed them all. Go to, go to. After your goodly and vainglorious banquet, I'll give you a choke pear. Are your own grafting? You were born in Venice, honorably descended from the Vitelli. Twas my cousin's fate, ill may I name the hour, to marry you. He bought you of your father. Ha! <laughs> he spent there in six months twelve thousand ducats, and, to my acquaintance, received in dowry with you not one Giulio. Twas a hard pennyworth the wear being so light. I yet but draw the curtain now to your picture. You came from thence a most notorious trumpet, and so you have continued. My lord! Nay, hear me. You shall have time to prate. My lord Bracciano, alas, I make but repetition of what is ordinary and rialto talk, and balloted and would be played are the stage, but that vice many times finds such loud friends that preachers are charmed silent. You, gentlemen, Flaminio and Marcello, the court hath nothing now to charge you with, only you must remain upon your sureties for your appearance. I stand for Marcello. And my lord duke for me. For you, Vittoria, your public fault, joined to the condition of the present time, takes from you all the fruits of noble pity. Such a corrupted trial have you made both of your life and beauty, and been styled no less an ominous fate than blazing stars to princes. Hear your sentence. You are confined unto a house of convertites, and your bawd— Aside. Who, I? The moor. Aside. Oh, I have a sound man again. A house of convertites. What's that? A house of penitent whores. Do the noblemen in Rome erect it for their wives that I am sent to lodge there? You must have patience. I must first have vengeance. I fain would know if you have your salvation by patent that you proceed thus. Away with her. Take her hence. A rape. A rape. How? Yes, you have ravished justice, forced her to do your pleasure. Fie, she's mad. Die with those pills in your most cursed maw should bring you health, or while you sit at the bench let your own spittle choke you. She's turned fury that the last day of judgment may so find you, and leave you the same devil you were before. Instruct me, some good horse-leech, to speak treason, for since you cannot take my life for deeds, take it for words. A woman's poor revenge, which dwells but in the tongue. I will not weep. No, I do scorn to call up one poor tear to fawn on your injustice. Bear me hence into this house of— What's your mitigating title? Of convertites. It shall not be a house of convertites. My mind shall make it honester to me than the Pope's palace, and more peaceable than thy soul, though thou art a cardinal. Know this, and let it somewhat raise your spite. Through darkness diamonds spread their richest light. Exit. Enter Bracciano. Now you and I are friends, sir. We'll shake hands in a friend's grave together. A fit place, being the emblem of soft peace, to atone our hatred. Sir, what's the matter? I will not chase more blood from that loved cheek. You have lost too much already. Fare you well. 
Exit. How strange these words sound. What's the interpretation? Aside. Good. This is a preface to the discovery of the Duchess's death. He carries it well. Because now I cannot counterfeit a whining passion for the death of my lady, I will feign a mad humour for the disgrace of my sister, and that will keep off idle questions. Treason's tongue have a villainous palsy in it. I will talk to any man, hear no man, and for a time appear a politic madman. Enter Giovanni and Count Lodovico. How now, my noble cousin, what, in black? Yes, uncle, I was taught to imitate you in virtue, and you must imitate me in colours of your garments. My sweet mother is— How? Where? Is there. No, yonder. Indeed, sir, I'll not tell you, for I shall make you weep. Is dead? Do not blame me now. I did not tell you so. Dead? Blessed lady, thou art now above thy woes. Wilt please your lordships to withdraw a little. What do the dead do, uncle? Do they eat, hear music, go a-hunting, and be merry as we that live? No, cuz. They sleep. Lord, Lord, that I were dead! I have not slept these six nights. When do they wake? When God shall please. Good God, let her sleep ever! For I have known her wake an hundred nights, when all the pillow where she laid her head was brine wet with her tears. I am to complain to you, sir. I'll tell you how they have used her now she's dead. They wrapped her in a cruel fold of lead and would not let me kiss her. Thou didst love her. I have often heard her say she gave me suck, and it should seem by that she dearly loved me since princes seldom do it. Oh all of my poor sister that remains take him away for god's sake exit giovanni how now my lord believe me i am nothing but her grave and i shall keep her blessed memory longer than thousand epitaphs exeunt scene three enter flaminio as distracted marcello and lodovico we endure the strokes like anvils or hard steel, till pain itself makes us no pain to feel. Who shall do me right now? Is this the end of service? I'd rather go weed, garlic, travail through France and be mine own ostler, wear sheepskin linings or shoes that stink of blacking, be entered into the list of the forty thousand peddlers in Poland. Enter Savoy Ambassador. Would I had rotted in some surgeon's house at Venice, built up on the pox as well as on piles, ere I had served Bracciano. You must have comfort. Your comfortable words are like honey. They relish well in your mouth that's whole, but in mine that's wounded they go down as if the sting of the bee were in them. Oh, they have wrought their purpose cunningly, as if they would not seem to do it of malice. In this, a politician imitates the devil, as the devil imitates a cannon. Wheresoever he comes to do mischief, he comes with his backside towards you. Enter French Ambassador. The proofs are evident. Proof? Twas corruption! O oh, gold, what a god art thou! And, O oh man, what a devil art thou to be tempted by that cursed mineral! Your diverse sibilant lawyer, mark him! Knaves turn informers as maggots turn to flies. You may catch gudgeons with either. A cardinal? I would he would hear me. There's nothing so holy but money will corrupt and putrefy it like victual under the line. Enter English Ambassador. You are happy in England, my lord. Here they sell justice with those weights they press men to death with. Oh, horrible salary! Fie, fie, Flaminio. Bells ne'er ring well till they are at their full pitch. And I hope yon cardinal shall never have the grace to pray well till he come to the scaffold. If they were racked now to know the confederacy, but 
Your noblemen are privileged from the rack, and well may, for a little thing would pull some of them a pieces before they came to their arraignment. Religion, oh, how it is co-meddled with policy! The first blood shed in the world happened about religion. Who would I were a Jew? Oh, there are too many. You are deceived. There are not Jews enough, priests enough, nor gentlemen enough. How? I'll prove it. For if there were Jews enough, so many Christians would not turn usurers. If priests enough, one should not have six benefices. And if gentlemen enough, so many early mushrooms, whose best growth sprang from a dunghill, should not aspire to gentility. Farewell. Let others live by begging. Be thou one of them practice the art of Walner in England, to swallow all's given thee, and yet let one purgation make thee as hungry again as fellows that work in a saw-pit. I'll go hear the screech owl. Exit. This was Bracciano's pander, and tis strange that in such open and apparent guilt of his adulterous sister he dare utter so scandalous a passion. I must wind him. Re-enter Flaminio. How dares this banished count return to Rome his pardon not yet purchased? I have heard the deceased duchess gave him pension, and that he came along from Padua in the train of the young prince. There's somewhat in't. Physicians that cure poisons still do work with counter-poisons. Mark this strange encounter. The god of melancholy turn thy gall to poison, and let the stigmatic wrinkles in thy face, like to the boisterous waves in a rough tide, one still overtake another. I do thank thee, and I do wish ingeniously for thy sake the dog days all year long. How croaks the raven? Is our good duchess dead? Dead. O oh, fate! Misfortune comes like the coroner's business, huddle upon huddle. Shalt thou and I join housekeeping? Yes, content. Let's be unsociably sociable sit some three days together and discourse only with making faces lie in our clothes <laughs> with faggots for our pillows and be lousy in taffeta linings that genteel melancholy sleep all day yes and like your melancholic hair feed after midnight enter antonelli and gasparo we are observed. See how yon couple grieve. What a strange creature is a laughing fool, as if man were created to no use but only to show his teeth. I'll tell thee what. It would do well, instead of looking-glasses, to set one's face each morning by a saucer of a witch's congealed blood. Precious rogue, we'll never part. Never till the beggary of courtiers the discontent of churchmen want of soldiers and all the creatures that hang manacled worse than strappadoed on the lowest felly of fortune's wheel be taught in our two lives to scorn that world which life of means deprives my lord i bring good news the pope on his deathbed at the earnest suit of the great duke of florence hath signed your pardon, and restored unto you... Oh, I thank you for your news. Look up again, Flaminio. See my pardon. Why do you laugh? There was no such condition in our covenant. <laughs> Why? You shall not seem a happier man than I. You know our vow, sir. If you'll be merry, do it in a like posture, as if some great man sat while his enemy were executed. Though it be very lechery unto thee, do it with a crabbed politician's face your sister is a damnable whore ha oh, look you i spake that laughing dost ever think to speak again <laughs> do you hear wilt sell me forty ounces of her blood to water a mandrake poor lord you did vow to live a lousy creature yes 
like one that had forever forfeited the daylight by being in debt. <laughs> I do not greatly wonder you do break. Your lordship learned it long since. But I'll tell you. What? And shall stick by you. <laughs> I long for it. This laughter scurvily becomes your face. If you will not be melancholy, be angry. Strikes him. See, now I laugh too. <laughs> you are to blame. I'll force you hence. Unhand me. Exeunt Marcello and Flaminio. But ere I should be forced to write myself upon a panda. My lord. Who had been as good met with his fist a thunderbolt. How this shows. Odds death, how did my sword miss him? <sighs> These rogues that are most weary of their lives still scape the greatest dangers. A pox upon him, all his reputation, nay, all the goodness of his family, is not worth half this earthquake. I learned it of no fencer to shake thus. Come, I'll forget him and go drink some wine. <laughs> Exeunt. End of Act Three. Act Four of The White Devil by John Webster. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four, Scene One. Enter Francisco and Monticelso. Come, come, my lord, untie your folded thoughts, and let them dangle loose as a bride's hair, your sister's poisoned. Far be it from my thoughts to seek revenge. What, are you turned all marble? Shall I defy him and impose a war most burthensome on my poor subjects' necks, which at my will I have not power to end? You know, for all the murders, rapes, and thefts committed in the horrid lust of war, he that unjustly caused it first proceed shall find it in his grave and in his seed. That's not the course I'd wish you. Pray observe me. We see that undermining more prevails than doth the cannon. Bear your wrongs concealed, and patient as the tortoise, let this camel stalk o'er your back unbruised. Sleep with the lion, and let this brood of secure, foolish mice play with your nostrils till the time be ripe for the bloody audit and the fatal gripe. Aim like a cunning fowler, close one eye, that you the better may your game espy. Free me, my innocence, from treacherous acts. I know there's thunder yonder, and I'll stand like a safe valley which low bends the knee to some aspiring mountain, since I know treason, like spiders weaving nets for flies, by her foul work is found, and in it dies. To pass away these thoughts, my honoured lord, it is reported you possess a book, wherein you have quoted by intelligence the names of all notorious offenders lurking about the city. Sir, I do, and some there are which call it my black book. Well may the title hold, for though it teach not the art of conjuring, yet in it lurk the names of many devils. Pray, let's see it. I'll fetch it to your lordship. Exit. Monticelso, I will not trust thee, but in all my plots I'll rest as jealous as a town besieged. Thou canst not reach what I intend to act. Your flax soon kindles, soon is out again, but gold slow heats, and long will hot remain. Enter Monticelso with the book. Tis here, my lord. First, your intelligencers, pray, let's see. Their number rises strangely, and some of them you'd take for honest men. Next are panders. These are your pirates. 
and these following leaves for base rogues that undo young gentlemen, by taking up commodities, for politic bankrupts, for fellows that are bawds to their own wives, only to put off horses and slight jewels, clocks, defaced plate, and such commodities, at birth of their first children. Are there such? These are for impudent bawds, that go in men's apparel, for usurers that share with scriveners for their good reportage, for lawyers that will antedate their writs, and some divines you might find folded there, but that I slipped them o'er for conscience' sake. Here is a general catalogue of knaves. A man might study all the prisons o'er, yet never attain this knowledge. Murderers! Fold down the leaf, I pray. Good my lord, let me borrow this strange doctrine. Pray used, my lord. I do assure your lordship you are a worthy member of the state, and have done infinite good in your discovery of these offenders. Somewhat, sir. Oh, God, better than tribute of wolves paid in England, twill hang their skins on the hedge. I must make bold to leave your lordship. Dearly, sir, I thank you. If any ask for me at court, report you have left me in the company of knaves. Exit, Monticelso. I gather now by this some cunning fellow that's my lord's officer, and that lately skipped from a clerk's desk up to a justice chair, hath made this knavish summons, and intends, as the Irish rebels won't were to sell heads, so to make prize of these. And thus it happens, your poor rogues pay for it, which have not the means to present bribe in fist. The rest of the band are raised out of the knave's record, or else my lord he winks at them with easy will. His man grows rich, the knaves are the knaves still. But to the use I'll make of it, it shall serve to point me out a list of murderers, agents for my villainy. Did I want ten leash of courtesans, it would furnish me, nay, laundress three armies, that in so little paper should lie the undoing of so many men. Tis not so big as twenty declarations. See the corrupted use some make of books. Divinity, wrested by some factious blood, draws swords, swells battles, and o'erthrows all good. To fashion my revenge more seriously, let me remember my dear sister's face. Call for her picture? No. I'll close mine eyes, and, in a melancholic thought, I'll frame her figure for me. Enter Isabella's ghost. Now I have it. How strong imagination works, how she can frame things which are not. Methinks she stands afore me, and by the quick idea of my mind, were my skill pregnant, I could draw her picture. Thought, as a subtle juggler, makes us deem things supernatural, which have cause common as sickness. Tis my melancholy. How camest thou by thy death? How idle am I to question mine own idleness? Did ever man dream awake till now? Remove this object. Out of my brain with it. What have I to do with tombs or deathbeds, funerals or tears, that have to meditate upon revenge? Exit, ghost. So, now, tis ended, like an old wife's story. Statesmen think often they see stranger sights than madmen. Come, to this weighty business. My tragedy must have some idle mirth in it, else it will never pass. I am in love, in love with Corombona, and my suit thus halts to her in verse. He writes. I have done it rarely. Oh, the fate of princes! I am so used to frequent flattery that, being alone, I now flatter myself. But it will serve. Tis sealed. Enter servant. 
bear this to the house of convertites and watch your leisure to give it to the hands of corombona or to the matron when some followers of bracciano may be by away exit servant he that deals all by strength his wit is shallow when a man's head goes through each limb will follow the engine for my business bold count lodowick tis gold must such an instrument procure with empty fist no man doth falcon's lure bracciano i am now fit for thy encounter like the wild irish i'll ne'er think thee dead till i can play at football with thy head flectera sinequeo superos acaronta muebo exit scene two enter the matron and flaminio should it be known the duke hath such recourse to your imprisoned sister i were like to incur much damage by it not a scruple the pope lies on his deathbed, and their heads are troubled now with other business than guarding of a lady enter servant yonder's flamineo in conference with a matrona let me speak with you i would entreat you to deliver for me this letter to the fair vittoria i shall sir enter bracciano with all care and secrecy hereafter you shall know me and receive thanks for this courtesy exit how now what's that a letter to my sister i'll see it delivered what's that you read flaminio look ha huh. to the most unfortunate his best respected vittoria who is the messenger i know not no who, who sent it odds foot you speak as if a man should know what fowl is coffined in a baked meat afore you cut it up i'll open it word her heart what's here subscribed florence this juggling is gross and palpable i have found out the conveyance read it read it reads the letter your tears i'll turn to triumphs be but mine your prop is fallen i pity that a vine which princes heretofore have longed to gather wanting supporters now should fade and wither <laughs> wine if faith my lord with lees would serve his turn your sad imprisonment i'll soon uncharm and with a princely uncontrolled arm lead you to florence where my love and care shall hang your wishes in my silver hair a halter on his strange equivocation nor for my years return me the sad willow who prefer blossoms before fruit that's mellow <laughs> rotten on my knowledge with lying too long in the bedstraw and all the lines of age this line convinces the gods never wax old no more do princes <laughs> a pox on it tear it let's have no more atheists for god's sake god's death i'll crush her into atomies and let the irregular north wind sweep her up and blow her into his nostrils where's this whore what what do you call her oh i could be mad prevent the cursed disease she'll bring me to and tear my hair off Where's this changeable stuff? Oh, head and ears and water, I assure you. She is not for your wearing. In, you pander! What? Me, my lord? Am I your dog? A bloodhound! Do you brave? Do you stand me? Stand you? Let those that have diseases run. I need no plasters. Would you be kicked? Would you have your neck broke? I tell you, Duke, I am not in Russia. My shins must be kept whole. Do you know me? Oh, my lord, methodically. As in this world there are degrees of evils, so in this world there are degrees of devils. You're a great duke, I your poor secretary. I do look now for a Spanish fig or an Italian salad daily. Pander, ply your convoy and leave your prating. All your kindness to me is like that miserable courtesy of Polyphemus to Ulysses. You reserve me to be devoured last. You would dig turfs out of my grave to feed your larks. That would be music to you come i'll lead you to her do you face me oh sir i would not go before a politic enemy with my back towards him though there were behind me a whirlpool enter vittoria to bracciano and flaminio can you read mistress look upon that letter there are no characters no hieroglyphics 
Ye need no comment. I am grown your receiver. God's precious, you shall be a brave great lady, a stately and advanced whore. Say, sir. Come, come, let's see your cabinet, discover your treasury of love letters. Death and furies, I'll see them all. Sir, upon my soul, I have not any. Whence was this directed? Confusion on your politic ignorance. You are reclaimed, are you? I'll give you the bells and let you fly to the devil. Where, Hawk, my lord? Florence. This is some treacherous plot, my lord. To me he ne'er was lovely, I protest, so much as in my sleep. Ah, right, there are plots. Your beauty, oh, ten thousand curses, aunt! How long have I beheld the devil in crystal? Thou hast led me like an heathen sacrifice with music and with fatal yokes of flowers to my eternal ruin. Woman to man is either a god or a wolf. My lord. Away. We'll be as differing as two adamants. The one shall shun the other. What? Dost weep? Procure but ten of thy dissembling trade. You'd furnish all the Irish funerals with howling past wild Irish. Fie, my lord. That hand, that cursed hand, which I have wearied with doting kisses. Oh, my sweetest duchess, how lovely art thou now! My loose thoughts scatter like quicksilver. I was bewitched, for all the world speaks ill of thee. No matter. I'll live so now. I'll make that world recant and change her speeches. You did name your duchess. Whose death God pardon. Whose death God revenge on thee, most godless duke. Now for two whirlwinds. What have I gained by thee but infamy? Thou hast stained the spotless honour of my house, And frighted thence noble society, Like those which sick the palsy, And retain ill-scenting foxes bout them, Are still shunned by those of choicer nostrils. What do you call this house? Is this your palace? Did not the judge style it a house of penitent whores? Who sent me to it, to this incontinent college? Is not you? Is not your high preferment? Go, go, brag how many ladies you have undone like me. Fare you well, sir, let me hear no more of you. I had a limb corrupted to an ulcer, but I have cut it off, and now I'll go weeping to heaven on crutches. For your gifts I will return them all, and I do wish that I could make you full executor to all my sins. Oh, that I could toss myself into a grave as quickly! For all thou art worth I'll not shed one tear more, I'll burst first. She throws herself upon a bed. I I have drunk Lethe. Vittoria! My, my dearest happiness, Vittoria! Why do you ail, my love? Why do you weep? Yes, I now weep poniards, do you see? Are not those matchless eyes mine? I had rather they were not matches. Is not this lip mine? Yes, thus to bite it off rather than give it thee. Turn to my lord, good sister. Hence you pander. Pander? Am I the author of your sin? Yes, he's a base thief that a thief lets in. We're blown up, my lord. Wilt thou hear me once to be jealous of thee is to express that I will love thee everlastingly, and never more be jealous. O oh, thou fool, whose greatness hath by much o'ergrown thy wit! What darest thou do that I not dare to suffer, excepting to be still thy whore? For that in the sea's bottom sooner thou shalt make a bonfire. O oh, no oaths, for God's sake! Will you hear me? Never. What a damned imposthume is a woman's will! Can nothing break it? Aside. Fie, fie, my lord! Women are caught as you take tortoises. She must be turned on her back. Sister, by this hand I am on your side. Come, come, you've wronged her. What a strange, credulous man were you, my lord, to think the Duke of Florence would love her. Will any mercer take another's wear when once tis toused and sullied? And yet, sister, how scurvily this forwardness becomes you! Young leverets stand not long, and women's anger should, like their flight, procure a little sport. A full cry for a quarter of an hour, 
and then be put to the dead quat. Shall these eyes, which have so long time dwelt upon your face, be now put out? No cruel landlady in the world which lends forth groats to broom men and takes use for them would do it. Hand her, my lord, and kiss her. Be not like a ferret to let go your hold with blowing. Let us renew right hands. Hence! Never shall rage or the forgetful wine make me commit like fault. Now you are the way to it. Follow it hard. Be thou at peace with me. Let all the world threaten the cannon. Mark his penitence. Best natures do commit the grossest faults when they are given o'er to jealousy, as best wine, dying, makes strongest vinegar. I'll tell you, the sea's more rough and raging than calm rivers, but not so sweet nor wholesome. A quiet woman is a still water under a great bridge. A man may shoot her safely. O oh, ye dissembling men! We sucked that, sister, from women's breasts in our first infancy. To add misery to misery. Sweetest! Am I not low enough? Ay, ay, your good heart gathers like a snowball now your affection's cold. Odds foot it shall melt to a heart again, or all the wine in Rome shall run o'er the lees for it. Your dog or hawk should be rewarded better than I have been. I'll speak not one word more. Stop her mouth with a sweet kiss, my lord. So, now the tide's turned, the vessels come about. He's a sweet armful. Oh, we curl-haired men are still most kind to women. This is well. That you should chide thus. Oh, sir, your little chimneys do ever cast most smoke. I sweat for you, couple together with as deep a silence as did the Grecians in their wooden horse. My lord, supply your promises with deeds. You know that painted meat no hunger feeds. Stay, ungrateful Rome. Rome, it deserves to be called Barbary for our villainous usage. Soft, the same project which the Duke of Florence whether in love or gallery I know not, laid down for her escape, will I pursue. And no time fitter than this night, my lord. The pope being dead, and all the cardinals entered the conclave for the electing a new pope, the city, in a great confusion, we may attire her in a page's suit, lay her post-horse, take shipping, and a main for Padua. I'll instantly steal forth the prince Giovanni, and make for Padua. You two, with your old mother and young Marcello that attends on Florence, if you can work him to it, follow me. I will advance you all. For you, Vittoria, think of a duchess title. Lo, you sister. Stay, my lord. I'll tell you a tale. The crocodile, which lives in the river Nilus, hath a worm breeds in the teeth of it, which puts it to extreme anguish. A little bird, no bigger than a wren, is barber surgeon to this crocodile, flies into the jaws of it, picks out the worm, and brings present remedy. The fish, glad of ease, but ungrateful to her that did it, that the bird may not talk largely of her abroad for none payment, closeth her chaps, intending to swallow her, and so put her to perpetual silence. But nature, loathing such ingratitude, hath armed this bird with a quill or prick on the head, top of the witch, wounds the crocodile in the mouth, forceth her open her bloody prison, and away flies the pretty toothpicker from her cruel patient. Your application is, I have not rewarded the service you have done me. <sighs> no, my lord. You, sister, are the crocodile. You are blemished in your fame. My lord cures it. And though the comparison hold not in every particle, yet Observe, remember what good the bird with the prick in the head hath done you, and scorn ingratitude. It may appear to some ridiculous thus to talk knave and madman, and sometimes come in with a dried sentence stuffed with sage, but this allows my varying of shapes. Knaves do grow great by being great men's apes. Scene 3. Enter Francisco, Lodovico. Gasparo, and six ambassadors. So, my lord, I commend your diligence. Guard well the conclave, and as the order is, let none have conference with the cardinals. 
i shall my lord room for the ambassadors they are wondrous brave to-day why do they wear these several habits oh, sir they're knights of several orders that lord in the black cloak with the silver cross is knight of rhodes the next knight of st michael that of the golden fleece the frenchman there knight of the holy ghost my lord of savoy knight of the annunciation the englishman is knight of the honoured garter dedicated unto their saint st george i could describe to you their several institutions with the laws annexed to their orders but the time permits not such discovery where's count lodowick here my lord tis on the point of dinner time marshal the cardinal's service sir i shall enter servants with several dishes covered stand let me search your dish who's this for for my lord cardinal montecelso who's this for my lord cardinal of bourbon why doth he search the dishes to observe what meat is dressed no sir but to prevent lest any letters should be conveyed in to bribe or to solicit the advancement of any cardinal when fast they enter tis lawful for the ambassadors of princes to enter with them and to make their suit for any man their prince affecteth best but after to the general election no man may speak with them you that attend on the lord cardinals open the window and receive their viands cardinal within you must return the service. The Lord Cardinals are busied about electing of the Pope. They have given o'er scrutiny, and are fallen to admiration. Away, away. I'll lay a thousand ducats you hear news of a Pope presently. Hark! Sure he's elected. Behold, my Lord of Aragon appears on the church battlements. A Cardinal on the terrace. Denuntio vobis gaudium magnum reverendissimus cardinalis lorenzo de monticelso electus est in sedem apostolicam et elegit sibi nomen paulum quartum vius sanctus pater paulus quartus vittoria my lord well what of her is fled the city ha with a duke brasciano fled where's the prince giovanni gone with his father let the matrona of the convertites be apprehended fled oh damnable how fortunate are my wishes why twas this i only laboured i did send the letter to instruct him what to do thy fame fond duke i first have poisoned directed thee the way to marry a whore what can be worse this follows the hand must act to drown the passionate tongue I scorn to wear a sword and prate of wrong. Enter Monticelso in state. Concedimus vobis apostolicum benedictinum et remissionum peccatorum. My lord reports Vittoria Corombona is stolen from forth the house of Convertites by Bracciano, and there fled the city. Now, though this be the first day of our seat, we cannot better please the divine power than to sequester from the holy church these cursed persons. Make it therefore known, we do denounce excommunication against them both. All that are theirs in Rome we likewise banish. Set on. Exeunt all but Francisco and Lodovico. Come, dear Lodovico. You have taken the sacrament to prosecute the intended murder? With all constancy. But, sir, I wonder you'll engage yourself in person, being a great prince. Divert me not. Most of his court are of my faction, and some are of my counsel. Noble friend, our danger shall be like in this design. Give leave part of the glory may be mine. Exit Francisco. Enter Montecelso. Why did the Duke of Florence with such care labour your pardon? Say, <laughs> Italian beggars will resolve you that, who begging of arms bid those they beg of do good for their own sakes. Or it may be he spreads his bounty with a sewing hand, 
like kings who many times give out of measure not for desert so much as for their pleasure i know your cunning come what devil was that that you were raising devil my lord i ask you how doth the duke employ you that his bonnet fell with such compliment unto his knee when he departed from you oh, why my lord he told me of a resty barbary horse which he would fain have brought to the career the salt and the ring galliard now my lord i have a rare french rider <laughs> take your heed lest the jade break your neck do you put me off with your wild horse tricks sirrah you do lie o oh, thou art a foul black cloud and thou dost threat a violent storm storms are in the air my lord i am too low to storm wretched creature i know that thou art fashioned for all ill like dogs that once get blood they'll ever kill about some murder was t not i'll not tell you and yet i care not greatly if i do marry with this preparation holy father i come not to you as an intelligencer but as a penitent sinner what i utter is in confession merely which you know must never be revealed you have overtaken me sir i did love bracciano's duchess dearly or rather i pursued her with hot lust though she ne'er knew on t she was poisoned upon my soul she was for which i have sworn to avenge her murder to the duke of florence to him i have miserable creature if thou persist in this tis damnable dost thou imagine thou canst slide on blood and not be tainted with a shameful fall or like the black and melancholic yew tree dost think to root thyself in dead men's graves and yet to prosper instruction to thee comes like sweet showers to all hardened ground they wet but pierce not deep and so i leave thee with all the furies hanging about thy neck, till by thy penitence thou removes this evil, in conjuring from thy breast that cruel devil. Exit. Hmm. I'll give it all. He says tis damnable. Besides, I did expect his suffrage by reason of Camillo's death. Enter servant and Francisco. Do you know that count? yes my lord bear him these thousand ducats to his lodging tell him the pope hath sent them happily that will confirm more than all the rest exit sir to me sir his holiness hath sent you a thousand crowns and wills you if you travel to make him your patron for intelligence his creature ever to be commanded why now tis come about he railed upon me and yet these crowns were told out and laid ready before he knew my voyage oh the art the modest form of greatness that do sit like brides at wedding dinners with their looks turned from the least wanton jests their puling stomach sick from the modesty when their thoughts are loose even acting of those hot and lustful sports are to ensue about midnight such his cunning he sounds my depth thus with a golden plummet i am doubly armed now now to the act of blood there's but three furies found in spacious hell but in a great man's breast three thousand dwell exit end of act four
Act Five of The White Devil by John Webster. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Five, Scene One A Passage Over the Stage of Bracciano, Flaminio, Marcello, Hortensio, Corombona, Cornelia, Zanche, and others. Flaminio and Hortensio remain. In all the weary minutes of my life, day ne'er broke up till now. This marriage confirms me happy. Tis a good assurance. Saw you not yet the moor that's come to court? Yes, and conferred with him in the duke's closet. I have not seen a goodlier personage, nor ever talked with man better experienced in state affairs or rudiments of war. He hath, by report, served the Venetian in candy these twice seven years, and been chief in many a bold design. What are those two that bear him company? Two noblemen of Hungary, that, living in the Emperor's service as commanders eight years since, contrary to the expectation of the court, entered into religion in the strict order of Capuchins. But, being not well settled in their undertaking, they left their order and returned to court, for which, being after troubled in conscience, they vowed their service against the enemies of Christ, went to Malta, were there knighted, and in their return back at this great solemnity, they are resolved for ever to forsake the world, and settle themselves here in a house of Capuchins in Padua. Tis strange. One thing makes it so. They have vowed for ever to wear, next their bare bodies, those coats of mail they served in. Hard penance. Is the more a Christian? He is. Why proffers he his service to our duke? Because he understands there's like to grow some wars between us and the Duke of Florence, in which he hopes employment. I never saw one in a stern, bold look wear more command, nor in a lofty phrase express more knowing or more deep contempt of our slight airy courtiers, as if he travelled all the prince's courts of Christendom, in all things strives to express that all that should dispute with him may know, glories like glow-worms afar off shine bright, but looked too near have neither heat nor light. The Duke. Enter Bracciano, Francisco, disguised like Molinassar. Lodovico and Gasparo, bearing their swords, their helmets down. Antonelli, Farnese. You are nobly welcome. We have heard it full, your honorable service, against the Turk. To you, brave Molinassar, we assign a competent pension, and are inly sorry the vows of those two worthy gentlemen make them incapable of our proffered bounty. Your wish is you may leave your warlike swords for monuments in our chapel. I accept it as a great honor done me, and must crave your leave to furnish out our duchess revels. Only one thing, as the last vanity you e'er shall view, deny me not to stay to see a barrier's prepared delight, eh? You shall have private standings. It hath pleased the great ambassadors of several princes in their return from Rome to their own countries to grace our marriage, and to honor me with such a kind of sport. I shall persuade them to stay, my lord. Set on there to the presence. Exeunt Bracciano, Flaminio, and Hortensio. Noble, my lord, most fortunately welcome. The conspirators here embrace. You have our vows sealed with the sacrament to second your attempts. And all things ready. He could not have invented his own ruin, had he despaired, with more propriety. You would not take my way. Tis better ordered. To have poisoned his prayer book, or a pair of beads, the pummel of his saddle, his looking glass, or the handle of his racket, oh, that, that, that while he had been bandying at tennis, he might have sworn himself to hell, and struck his soul into the hazard. Oh, my lord, I would have our plot be ingenious, and have it hereafter recorded for example, rather than borrow example. There's no way more speeding than this thought on. On, then. And yet methinks that this revenge is poor, because it steals upon him like a thief. To have taken him by the cask in a pitched field, led him to Florence. It had been rare, and there have crowned him with a wreath of stinking garlic, 
to have shown the sharpness of his government and rankness of his lust flaminio comes exeunt lodovico antonelli and gasparo enter flaminio marcello and zanche why doth this devil haunt you say i know not for by this light i do not conjure for her tis not so great a cunning as men think to raise the devil for he has won up already the greatest cunning were to lay him down she is your shame i prithee pardon her in faith you see women are like to birds where their affection throws them there they'll stick that is my countryman a goodly person when he's at leisure i'll discourse with him in our own language i beseech you do exit zanche how is't brave soldier oh that i had seen some of your iron days i pray relate some of your service to us tis a ridiculous thing for a man to be his own chronicle i did never wash my mouth with mine own praise for fear of getting a stinking breath you're too stoical the duke will expect other discourse from you i shall never flatter him i have studied man too much to do that what difference is between the duke and i no more than between two bricks all made of one clay only it may be one is placed in top of a turret the other in the bottom of a well by mere chance if i were placed as high as the duke i should stick as fast make as fair a show and bear out weather equally if this soldier had a patent to beg in churches then he would tell them stories i have been a soldier too how have you thrived faith poorly that's the misery of peace only outsides are then respected as ships seem very great upon the river which show very little upon the seas so some men in the court seem colossuses in a chamber who if they came into the field would appear pitiful pygmies give me a fair room yet hung with arras and some great cardinal to lug me by the ears as his endeared minion and thou mayest do the devil knows what villainy and safely right you shall see in the country in harvest time pigeons though they destroy never so much corn the farmer dare not present the fowling piece to them why because they belong to the lord of the manor whilst your poor sparrows that belong to the lord of heaven they go to the pot for it i will give you some politic instruction the duke says he will give you pension that's but bare promise get it under his hand for i have known men that have come from serving against the turk for three or four months they have had pension to buy them new wooden legs and fresh plasters but after it was not to be had and this miserable courtesy shows as if a tormentor should give hot cordial drinks to one three-quarters dead of the rack only to fetch the miserable soul again to endure more dog days exit francesco enter hortensio a young lord zanche and two more how now gallants what are they ready for the barriers yes the lords are putting on their armour what's he a new upstart one that swears like a falconer and will lie in the duke's ear day by day like a maker of almanacs and yet i knew him since he came to the court smell worse of sweat than an under tennis court keeper look you yonder's your sweet mistress thou art my sworn brother i'll tell thee i do love that moor that witch very constrainedly she knows some of my villainy I do love her just as a man holds a wolf by the ears, but for fear of her turning upon me and pulling out my throat, I would let her go to the devil. I hear she claims marriage of thee. Faith, I made to her some such dark promise, and in seeking to fly from it, I ran on, like a frighted dog with a bottle at its tail, that fain would bite it off and yet dares not look behind him. Now, my precious gypsy. Ay, your love to me rather cools than heats. Marry, I am the sounder lover. We have many wenches about the town, heat too fast. What do you think of these perfumed gallants, then? Their satin cannot save them. I am confident they have a certain spice of the disease, for they that sleep with dogs shall rise with fleas. Believe it. A little painting and gay clothes make you loathe me. How, love a lady for painting or gay apparel? I'll unkennel one example more for thee. Aesop had a foolish dog that let go the flesh to catch the shadow. I would have courtiers be better diners. You remember your oaths? Lovers' oaths are like mariners' prayers uttered in extremity. 
but when the tempest is o'er and that the vessel leaves tumbling they fall from protesting to drinking and yet amongst gentlemen protesting and drinking go together and agree as well as shoemakers and westphalia bacon they are both draws on for drink draws on protestation and protestation draws on more drink is not this discourse better now than the morality of your sunburnt gentleman enter cornelia is this your perch you haggard fly to the stews strikes zanche you should be clapped by the heels now strike in the court exit cornelia she's good for nothing but to make her maids catch colder nights they dare not use a bedstaff for fear of her light fingers you're a strumpet an impudent one kicks zanche why do you kick her say do you think that she's like a walnut tree must she be cudgelled ere she bear good fruit she brags that you shall marry her what then i had rather she were pitched upon a stake in some new seated garden to affright her fellow crows thence you're a boy a fool be guardian to your hound i am of age if i take her near you i'll cut her throat with a fan of feather and for you i'll whip this folly from you are you choleric i'll purge it with rhubarb oh your brother hang him he wrongs me most thought to offend me least i do suspect my mother played foul play when she conceived thee now by all my hopes like the two slaughtered sons of oedipus the very flames of our affections shall turn to ways those words i'll make thee answer with thy heart blood do like the geese in the progress you know where you shall find me very good exit flaminio and thou beest a noble friend bear him my sword and bid him fit the length on it sir i shall exeunt all but zanche he comes hence petty thoughts of my disgrace enter francesco i ne'er loved my complexion till now cause i may boldly say without a blush i love you your love is untimely sown there's a spring at michaelmas but tis but a faint one i am sunk in years and i have vowed never to marry alas poor maids get more lovers than husbands yet you may mistake my wealth for as when ambassadors are sent to congratulate princes there's commonly sent along with them a rich present so that though the prince like not the ambassador's person nor words yet he likes well of the presentment so i may come to you in the same manner and be better loved for my dowry than my virtue i'll think on the motion do i'll now detain you no longer at your better leisure i'll tell you things shall startle your blood nor blame me that this passion i reveal lovers die inwards that their flames conceal of all intelligence this may prove the best sure i shall draw a strange fowl from this foul nest exeunt scene two enter marcello and cornelia i hear a whispering all about the court you are to fight who is your opposite what is the quarrel tis an idle rumour will you dissemble sure you do not well to fright me thus you never look thus pale but when you are most angry i do charge you upon my blessing nay i'll call the duke and he shall school you publish not a fear which would convert to laughter tis not so was not this crucifix my father's yes i have heard you say giving my brother suck he took the crucifix between his hands and broke a limb off enter flaminio yes but tis mended i have brought your weapon back flaminio runs marcello through ah oh my horror you have brought it home indeed help oh he's murdered do you turn your gall up i'll to sanctuary and send a surgeon to you exit enter lodovico hortensio and gasparo how for the ground oh mother now remember what i told of breaking of the crucifix farewell there are some sins which heaven doth duly punish in a whole family this it is to rise by all dishonest means let all men know that tree shall long time keep a steady foot whose branches spread no wider than the root 
dies. Oh, my perpetual sorrow. Virtuous Marcello, he's dead. Pray leave him, lady. Come, you shall. Alas, he is not dead. He's in a trance. Why, his nobody shall get anything by his death. Let me call him again, for God's sake. I would you were deceived. Oh, you abuse me. You abuse me. You abuse me. How many have gone away thus, for lack of tendance? Rear up's head, rear up's head. His bleeding inward will kill him. You see, he is departed. Let me come to him. Give me him as he is, if he be turned to earth. Let me but give him one hearty kiss, and you shall put us both in one coffin. Fetch a looking-glass. See if his breath will not stain it, or pull out some feathers from my pillow, and lay them to his lips. Will you lose him for a little pain's taking? Your kindest office is to pray for him. Alas, I would not pray for him yet. He may live to lay me the ground, and pray for me if you'll let me come to him. Enter Bracciano, all armed save the beaver, with Flaminio and others. Was this your handiwork? It was my misfortune. He lies. He lies. He did not kill him. These have killed him. That would not let him be better looked to. Have comfort, my grieved mother. Oh, you screech owl! Forbear, good madam. Let me go. Let me go. She runs to Flaminio with her knife drawn, and coming to him, lets it fall. The God of heaven forgive thee. Dost not wonder I pray for thee? I'll tell thee what's the reason. I have scarce breath to number twenty minutes. I'd not spend that in cursing. Fare thee well. Half of thyself lies there, and mayest thou live to fill an hourglass with his mouldered ashes, to tell how thou shouldst spend the time to come in blessed repentance. Mother, pray tell me, how came he by this death? What was the quarrel? Indeed, my younger boy presumed too much upon his manhood, gave him bitter words, drew his sword first, and so I know not how, for I was out of my wits. He fell with his head just in my bosom. That is not true, madam. I pray thee, peace. One arrow's grazed already. It were vain to lose this, for that will ne'er be found again. Go, bear the body to Cornelia's lodging, and we command that none acquaint our duchess with this sad accident. For you, Flaminio, hark you, I will not grant your pardon. No. Only a lease of your life, and that shall last but for one day. Thou shalt be forced each evening to renew it or be hanged. At your pleasure. Lodovico sprinkles Bracciano's beaver with a poison. Enter Francesco. Your will is law now. I'll not meddle with it. You once did brave me in your sister's lodging. I'll now keep you in awe for it. Where's our beaver? Aside. He calls for his destruction. Noble youth, I pity thy sad fate. Now to the barriers. This shall his passage to the black lake further. The last good deed he did, he pardoned murder. Exeunt. Scene three. Charges and shouts. They fight at barriers. First single pairs, then three to three. Enter Bracciano and Flaminio with others. An armor! Odds death an armor! Armorer, where's the armorer? Tear off my beaver. Are you hurt, my lord? Oh, my brain's on fire. Enter armorer. The helmet is poisoned. My lord, upon my soul. Away with him to torture. There are some great ones that have hand in this, and near about me. Enter Vittoria Carambona. Oh, my loved lord, poisoned. Remove the bar. Here's unfortunate revels. Call the physicians. Enter two physicians. A plague upon you! We have too much of your cunning here already. I fear the ambassadors are likewise poisoned. Oh, I'm gone already. The infection flies to the brain and heart. Oh, thou strong heart! There's such a covenant between the world and it they're loath to break. Oh, my most loved father! Remove the boy away. Where's this good woman? Had I infinite worlds there were too little for thee. Must I leave thee? What say you, screech owls, is the venom mortal? Most deadly. 
most corrupted politic hangman you kill without book but your art to save fails you as oft as great men's needy friends i that have given life to offending slaves and wretched murderers have i not power to lengthen mine own a twelve month to vittoria no, do not kiss me for i shall poison thee this unction sent from the great duke of florence sir be of comfort o thou soft natural death that art joint twin to sweetest slumber no rough-bearded comet stares on thy mild departure the dull owl bears not against thy casement the hoarse wolf scents not thy carrion pity winds thy course whilst horror waits on princes i am lost for ever how miserable a thing it is to die amongst women howling enter lodovico and gasparo as capuchins what are those franciscans they have brought the extreme unction on pain of death let no man name death to me it is a word infinitely terrible withdraw into our cabinet exeunt all but francesco and flaminio to see what solitariness is about dying princes as heretofore they have unpeopled towns divorced friends and made great houses unhospitable so now o oh justice where are their flatterers now flatterers are but the shadows of princes bodies the least thick cloud makes them invisible there's great moan made for him faith for some few hours salt water will run most plentifully in every office of the court but believe it most of them do weep over their stepmother's graves how mean you why they dissemble as some men do that live without compass or the verge come you have thrived well under him faith like a wolf in a woman's breast i have been fed with poultry but for money understand me i had as good a will to cousin him as e'er an officer of them all but i had not cunning enough to do it what didst thou think of him faith speak freely he was a kind of statesman that would sooner have reckoned how many cannon bullets he had discharged against a town to count his expense that way than think of how many of his valiant and deserving subjects he lost before it oh speak well of the duke i have done enter lodovico wilt hear some more of my court wisdom to reprehend princes is dangerous and to overcommend some of them is palpable lying how is it with the duke most deadly ill he's fallen into a strange distraction he talks of battles and monopolies levying of taxes and from that descends to the most brain-sick language his mind fastens on twenty several objects which confound deep sense with folly such a fearful end may teach some men that bear too lofty crest though they live happiest yet they die not best he hath conferred the whole state of the dukedom upon your sister till the prince arrive at mature age there's some good luck in that yet see here he comes enter bracciano presented in a bed vittoria and others there's death in his face already oh my good lord away you have abused me these speeches are several kinds of distractions and in the action should appear so you have conveyed coin forth our territories bought and sold offices oppressed the poor and i ne'er dreamt on it make up your accounts i'll thou be mine own steward sir have patience indeed i am to blame for did you ever hear the dusky raven chide blackness was never known the devil railed against cloven creatures oh my lord let me have some quails to supper sir you shall no so some fried dogfish your quails feed on poison that old dog fox that politician florence i'll forswear hunting and turn dog killer rare i'll be friends with him for mark you sir one dog still sets another a barking peace peace yonder's a fine slave come in now where why there in a blue bonnet and a pair of breeches with a great codpiece <laughs> look you his codpiece is stuck full of pins with pearls on the head of them do you not know him no my lord why tis the devil 
I know him by a great rose he wears on shoe to hide his cloven foot. Have dispute with him. He's a rare linguist. My lord hears nothing. Nothing? Rare nothing. When I want money, our treasury is empty. There is nothing. I'll not be used thus. Oh, lie still, my lord. See, see, Flaminio that killed his brother is dancing on the ropes there, and he carries a money bag in each hand to keep him even for fear of breaking his neck. And there's a lawyer in a gown whipped with velvet, stares and gapes when the money will fall. How the rogue cuts capers! It should have been an altar. Tis there. W what she? Vittoria, my lord. <laughs> Her hair is sprinkled with orris powder that makes her look as if she had sinned in the pastry. What's he? A divine, my lord. Bracciano seems here near his end. Lodovico and Gasparo, in the habit of Capuchins, present him in his bed with a crucifix and hallowed candle. Oh, he will be drunk. Avoid him. The argument is fearful when churchmen stagger in. Look you. Six grey rats that have lost their tails crawl upon the pillow. Send for a rat catcher. I, I'll do a miracle. I'll free the court from all foul vermin. Where's Flaminio? I do not like that he names me so often, especially on his deathbed. Tis a sign I shall not live long. See, he's near his end. Pray give us leave. Attende, Domine Brachiane. See how firmly he doth fix his eye upon the crucifix. Oh, hold it, Constant. It settles his wild spirits, and so his eyes melt into tears. Domine Brachiane, solebas in bello tutus esse tuo clipeo, nunc hunc clipeum hosti tuo hoponas infernali. Olim hasta valuisti in bello, Nunc hac sacram hastam vibravis contra hostem animarum. Attende, domine Brachiane, si nunc quoque probas ea quae acta sunt inter nos, flecte caput in dextrum. Esto securus, domine Brachiane, cogita quantum habeas meritorum, denique menimeris mean animam Pro tua opignoratum, si quid esset periculi. Si nunc quoque probas ea quae acta sunt inter nos, plecte caput in laevum. He is departing. Pray stand all apart, and let us only whisper in his ears some private meditations which our order permits you not to hear. Here, the rest being departed, Lodovico and Gasparo discover themselves. Bracciano. Devil, Bracciano, thou art damned. Perpetually. A slave condemned and given up to the gallows is thy great lord and master. True, for thou art given up to the devil. Oh, you slave! You that were held the famous politician, whose art was poison. And whose conscience murder. That would have broke your wife's neck down the stairs ere she was poisoned. That had your villainous salads. And fine embroidered bottles and perfumes, equally mortal with a winter plague. Now there's mercury. And copperas and quicksilver with other devilish pothecary stuff a melting in your politic brains dost hear this is count lodovico this gasparo and thou shalt die like a poor rogue and stink like a dead fly-blown dog and be forgotten before the funeral sermon Vittoria! Vittoria! Oh, the cursed devil comes to himself again. We are undone. Strangle him in private. Enter Vittoria and the attendants. What? 
Will you call him again to live in troubled torments? For charity, for Christian charity, avoid the chamber. You would prate, sir. This is a true love not sent from the Duke of Florence. Bracciano is strangled. What? Is it done? The snuff is out. No woman keeper in the world, though she had practised seven year at the pest house, could have done it quaintlier. My lords, he's dead. Rest, Rest to his, his soul. soul. Oh me, this place is hell. How heavily she takes it. Oh yes, yes. Had women navigable rivers in their eyes, they would dispend them all. Surely I wonder why we should wish more rivers to the city when they sell water so good cheap. I'll tell thee, these are but Moorish shades of griefs or fears. There's nothing sooner dry than women's tears. Why, here's an end of all my harvest. He has given me nothing. Caught promises! Let wise men count them cursed, for while you live, he that scores best pays worst. Sure this was Florence doing. Very likely. Those are found weighty strokes which come from the hand, but those are killing strokes which come from the head. Oh, the rare tricks of a Machiavellian! He doth not come like a gross plodding slave and buffet you to death. No, my quaint knave, he tickles you to death, makes you die laughing as if you'd swallowed down a pound of saffron. You see the feat. Tis practised in a trice. To teach court honesty, it jumps on ice. Now have the people liberty to talk, and descant on his vices. Misery of princes that must of force be censured by their slaves, not only blamed for doing things are ill, but for not doing all that all men will. One were better be a thresher. Odds death I would fain speak with this duke yet. Now he's dead? I cannot conjure, but if prayers or oaths will get to the speech of him, Though forty devils wait on him in his livery of flames, I'll speak to him and shake him by the hand, though I be blasted. Exit. Excellent Lodovico, what, did you terrify him at the last gasp? Yes, and so idly that the duke had liked to have terrified us. How? Enter the moor. You shall hear that hereafter. See, yon's the infernal that would make up sport. Now to the revelation of that secret she promised when she fell in love with you. You're passionately met in this sad world. I would have you look up, sir. These court tears claim not your tribute to them. Let those weep that guiltily partake in the sad cause. I knew last night, by a sad dream I had, some mischief would ensue. Yet, to say truth, my dream most concerned you. <laughs> Shall us fall a-dreaming? Yes, and for fashion's sake, I'll dream with her. Methought, sir, you came stealing to my bed. Wilt thou believe me, sweeting? By this light I was adreamt on thee, too, for methought I saw thee naked. Fie, sir, as I told you, methought you lay down by me. So dreamt I, and lest thou shouldst take cold, I covered thee with this Irish mantle. Verily I did dream. You were somewhat bold with me, but to come to it— How, how, I hope you will not go to it here. Nay, you must hear my dream out. Well, sir, forth. When I threw the mantle o'er thee, thou didst laugh exceedingly, methought. Laugh? And criedst out, the hair did tickle thee. There was a dream indeed. Mark her, I pray thee. She simpers like the suds a collier hath been washed in. Come, sir, good fortune tends you. I did tell you I would reveal a secret. Isabella, the Duke of Florence's sister, was empoisoned by a fumed picture, and Camillo's neck was broke by the damned Flaminio. The mischance laid on a vaulting horse. Most strange. Most true. The bed of snakes is broke. I sadly do confess I had a hand in the black deed. Thou kept'st their counsel. Right. For which, urged with contrition, I intend this night to rob Vittoria. 
<laughs> excellent penitence usurers dream on while they sleep out sermons <laughs> to further our escape i have entreated leave to retire me till the funeral unto a friend of the country that excuse will further our escape in coin and jewels i shall at least make good unto your use an hundred thousand crowns no oh, noble wench those crowns we'll share it is a dowry methinks should make that sunburnt proverb false and wash the ethiop white it shall away be ready for our flight an hour for day exit zanche o oh, strange discovery why till now we knew not the circumstances of either of their deaths re-enter zanche you'll wait about midnight in the chapel there exit zanche why now our axions justified tush for justice what harms it justice we now like the partridge purge the disease with laurel for the fame shall crown the enterprise and quit the shame exeunt scene four enter flaminio and gasparo at one door another way giovanni attended the young duke did you ever see a sweeter prince? I have known a poor woman's bastard better favoured. This is behind him. Now to his face. All comparisons were hateful. Wise was the courtly peacock that, being a great minion, and being compared for beauty by some dotterels that stood by to the kingly eagle, said the eagle was a far fairer bird than herself, not in respect of her feathers, but in respect of her long talons. His will grow out in time. My gracious lord, I pray leave me, sir. Your grace must be merry. Tis I have cause to mourn, for what you what said the little boy that rode behind his father on horseback? Why, what said he? When you are dead, father, said he, I hope that I shall ride in the saddle. Oh, tis a brave thing for a man to sit by himself. He may stretch himself in the stirrups, look about, and see the whole compass of the hemisphere. You are now, my lord, in the saddle. Study your prayers, sir, and be penitent. Twere fit you'd think on what hath former been. I have heard grief named the eldest child of sin. Exit. Study my prayers. He threatens me divinely. I am falling to pieces already. I care not, though like Anacarsis I were pounded to death in a mortar, and yet that death were fitter for usurers, gold, and themselves to be beaten together to make a most cordial callous for the devil. He have his uncle's villainous look already in decimo sexto enter courtier now sir what are you it is the pleasure sir of the young duke that you forbear the presence and all rooms that owe him reverence so the wolf and the raven are very pretty fools when they are young it is your office sir to keep me out so the duke wills verily master courtier extremity is not to be used in all offices Say that a gentlewoman were taken out of her bed about midnight and committed to Castle Angelo to the tower yonder with nothing about her but her smock, would it not show a cruel part in the gentleman porter to lay claim to her upper garment, pull it o'er her head and ears, and put her in naked? Very good. You are merry. Exit. Doth he make a court ejectment of me? A flaming firebrand casts more smoke without a chimney than within it. I'll smoor some of them. Enter Francesco de Medici. How now? Thou art sad. I met even now with the most piteous sight. Thou meet'st another here, a pitiful degraded courtier. Your reverend mother is grown a very old woman in two hours. I found them winding of Marcello's course, and there is such a solemn melody between doleful songs, tears, and sad elegies, such as old granddames watching by the dead were wont to outwear the knights with that believe me i had no eyes to guide me forth the room they were so o'ercharged with water i will see them twere much uncharity in you for your sight will add unto their tears i will see them they are behind the traverse i'll discover their superstitions howling he draws the transverse cornelia the moor and three other ladies discovered winding marcello's course a song this rosemary is withered pray get fresh i would have these herbs grow upon his grave when i am dead and rotten reach the bays 
I'll tie a garland here about his head. I have kept this twenty year, and every day hallowed it with my prayers. I did not think he should have wore it. Look you, who are yonder? Oh, reach me the flowers. Her ladyship's foolish. Alas, her grief hath turned her child again. You're very welcome. To Forminio. There's rosemary for you, and rue for you, heart's ease for you. I pray make much of it. I have left more for myself. Lady, who's this? You are, I take it, the grave-maker. So? Tis Flaminio. Will you make me such a fool? Here's a white hand. Can blood so soon be washed out? Let me see. When screech-owls croak upon the chimney-tops, And the strange cricket in the oven sings and hops, When yellow spots do on your hands appear, Be certain then you of a course shall hear. Out upon it, how tis speckled. He has handled a toad sure. Cowslip water is good for the memory. Pray, buy me three ounces of it. I would I were from hence. Do you hear, sir? I'll give you a saying which my grandmother was wont, when she heard the bell toll, to sing o'er unto her lute. Do, and you will, do. Cornelia doth this in several forms of distraction. Call for the robin redbreast and the wren, since o'er shady groves they hover, and with leaves and flowers do cover the friendless bodies of unburied men. Call unto his funeral dole the ant, the field mouse, and the mole, to rear him hillocks that shall keep him warm, and, when gay tombs are robbed, sustain no harm. But keep the wolf far thence, that's foe to men, for with his nails he'll dig them up again. They would not bury him, cause he died in a quarrel, but I have an answer for them. Let Holy Church receive him duly, since he paid the church tithes truly. His wealth is summed, and this is all his store. This poor men get, and great men get no more. Now the wares are gone, we may shut up shop. Bless you all, good people. Exeunt Cornelia and ladies. I have a, a strange thing in me to the which I cannot give a name, without it be compassion. I pray leave me. Exit Francesco. This night I'll know the utmost of my fate. I'll be resolved what my rich sister means to assign me for my service. I have lived riotously ill, like some that live in court, and sometimes, when my face was full of smiles, have felt the maze of conscience in my breast. Oft gay and honoured robes these tortures try. We think caged birds sing, when indeed they cry. Enter Bracciano's ghost, in his leather cassock and breeches, boots, a cowl, a pot of lily flowers, with a skull in it. Ha! I can stand thee. Nearer, nearer yet. What a mockery have death made thee. Thou lookst sad. In what place art thou? In yon starry gallery, or in the cursed dungeon? No, not speak. Pray, sir, resolve me. What religion's best for a man to die in? Or is it in your knowledge to answer me how long I have to live? That's the most necessary question. Not answer? Are you still like some great men that only walk like shadows up and down and to no purpose? Say— The ghost throws earth upon him and shows him the skull. What's that? Oh, fatal! He throws earth upon me! A dead man's skull beneath the roots of flowers? I pray, speak, sir. Our Italian churchmen make us believe dead men hold conference with their familiars, and many times will come to bed with them and eat with them. Exit, ghost. He's gone. And see, the skull and earth are vanished. This is beyond melancholy. I do dare my fate to do its worst. Now to my sister's lodging, and sum up all those horrors. 
the disgrace the prince threw on me, next the piteous sight of my dead brother, and my mother's dotage, and last this terrible vision. All these shall, with Vittoria's bounty, turn to good, or I will drown this weapon in her blood. Exit. Scene five. Enter Francesco, Lodovico, and Hortensio. My lord, upon my soul you shall know further. You have most ridiculously engaged yourself too far already. For my part I have paid all my debts. So if I should chance to fall, my creditors fall not with me. And I vow to quit all in this bold assembly to the meanest follower. My lord, leave the city, or I'll forswear the murder. Exit. Farewell, Lodovico. If thou dost perish in this glorious act, I'll rear unto thy memory that fame shall in the ashes keep alive thy name. Exit. There's some black deed on foot. I'll presently down to the citadel and raise some force. These strong court factions that do brook no checks in the career oft break the riders' necks. Exit. Scene six. Enter Vittoria with a book in her hand. Zanche, Flaminio following them. What? Are you at your prayers? Give o'er. How ruffian. I come to you about worldly business. Sit down, sit down. Nay, stay, blouse. You may hear it. The doors are fast enough. Huh. Are you drunk? Yes, yes, with wormwood water. You shall taste some of it presently. What intends the fury? You are my lord's executrix, and I claim reward for my long service. For your service? Come, therefore, here is pen and ink. Set down what you will give me. There. She writes. Ha! Huh? Have you done already? Tis a most short conveyance. I will read it. I give that portion to thee, and no other, which Cain groaned under, having slain his brother. A most courtly patent to beg by. You are a villain. Is't come to this? They say affrights cure agues. Thou hast a devil in thee. I will try if I can scare him from thee. Nay, sit still. My lord hath left me yet. Two cases of jewels shall make me scorn your bounty. You shall see them. Exit. Oh, sure he's distracted. Oh, he's desperate. For your own safety, give him gentle language. He enters with two cases of pistols. Look! These are better far at a dead lift than all your jewel house. And yet, methinks, these stones have no fair luster. They are ill set. I'll turn the right side towards you. You shall see how they will sparkle. Turn this horror from me. What do you want? What would you have me do? Is not all mine yours? Have I any children? Pray thee, good woman, do not trouble me with this vain worldly business. Say your prayers. Neither yourself nor I should outlive him the numbering of four hours. Did he enjoin it? He did, and t'was a deadly jealousy, lest any should enjoy thee after him, that urged him vow me to it. For my death I did propound it voluntarily, knowing if he could not be safe in his own court, being a great duke, what hope then for us? This is your melancholy and despair. Away! Fool thou art to think that politicians do use to kill the effects or injuries and let the cause live. Shall we groan in irons, or be a shameful and a weighty burden to a public scaffold? This is my resolve. I would not live at any man's entreaty, nor die at any's bidding. Will you hear me? My life hath done service to other men. My death shall serve mine own turn. Make you ready. Do you mean to die indeed? with as much pleasure as e'er my father gat me. Are the doors locked? Yes, madam. Are you grown an atheist? Will you turn your body, which is the goodly palace of the soul, to the soul's slaughter-house? Oh, the cursed devil, which doth present us with all other sins, thrice candied o'er, despair with gall and stibium, yet we carouse it off. Aside to Zanche. Cry out for help! Make us forsake that which was made for man, the world to sink to that was made for devil's eternal darkness. Help! Help! I'll stop your throat with winter plums. I pray thee yet remember, 
Millions are now in graves which at last day, like mandrakes, shall rise shrieking. Leave your prating, for these are but grammatical laments, feminine arguments, and they move me as some in pulpits move their auditory more with their exclamation than sense of reason or sound doctrine. Aside. Gentle madam, seem to consent. Only persuade him to teach the way to death. Let him die first. Tis good, I apprehend it. To kill one's self is meat that we must take like pills, not chewed but quickly swallow it. The smarter the wound or weakness of the hand may else bring treble torments. I have held it a wretched and most miserable life which is not able to die. Oh, but frailty! Yet I am now resolved. Farewell, affliction! Behold, Bracciano, I, that while you lived, did make a flaming altar of my heart to sacrifice unto you, now am ready to sacrifice heart and all. Farewell, Zanche. How, madam, do you think that I'll outlive you? Especially when my best self, Flaminio, goes the same voyage? Oh, most loved Moor! Only, by all my love, let me entreat you since it is most necessary one of us do violence on ourselves. Let you or I be her sad taster. Teach her how to die. Thou dost instruct me nobly. Take these pistols, because my hand is stained with blood already. Two of these you shall level at my breast, the other against your own, and so will die most equally contented. But first, swear not to outlive me. Most religiously. Then here's an end of me. Farewell, daylight. And, O oh, contemptible physic, that does take so long a study only to preserve so short a life. I take my leave of thee. Showing the pistols. These are two cupping glasses that shall draw all my infected blood out. Are you ready? Ready. Whither shall I go now? O oh, Lucian, thy ridiculous purgatory? To find Alexander the Great cobbling shoes, Pompey tagging points, and Julius Caesar making hair buttons, Hannibal selling blacking, and Augustus crying garlic, Charlemagne selling lists by the dozen, and King Pepin crying apples in a cart drawn with one horse. Whether I resolve to fire, earth, water, air, or all the elements by scruples, I know not, nor greatly care. Shoot! Shoot! Of all deaths, the violent death is best, for from ourselves it steals ourselves so fast, the pain, once apprehended, is quite past. They shoot and run to him, and tread upon him. What? Are you dropped? I am mixed with earth already. As you are noble, perform your vows, and bravely follow me. Whither? To hell? To most assured damnation. Oh, thou most cursed devil! Thou art caught. In thine own engine. I tread the fire out that would have been my ruin. Will you be perjured? What a religious oath was Styx, that the gods never durst swear by and violate? Oh, that we had such an oath to minister, and to be so well kept in our courts of justice. Think whither thou art going. And remember what villainies thou hast acted. This thy death shall make me, like a blazing ominous star, look up and tremble. Oh, I am caught with a spring. You see the fox comes many times short home. Tis here proved true. Killed with a couple of branches. No fitter offering for the infernal furies than one in whom they reigned while he was living. Oh, the way's dark and horrid. I cannot see. Shall I have no company? Oh, yes, thy sins do run before thee to fetch fire from hell to light thee thither. Oh, I smell soot, most stinking soot, the chimney's afire, my liver's parboiled like scotch holly bread. There's a plumber laying pipes in my guts. It scalds. Wilt thou outlive me? Yes, and drive a stake through thy body. For will give it out thou didst this violence upon thyself. O oh, cunning devils! Now I have tried your love, and doubled all your reaches. I am not wounded. Flaminio riseth. The pistols held no bullets. T'was a plot to prove your kindness to me, and I live to punish your ingratitude. I knew one time or other you would find a way to give me a strong potion. 
O oh, men that lie upon your deathbeds and are haunted with howling wives, ne'er trust them. They'll remarry ere the worm pierce your winding sheet, ere the spider make a thin curtain for your epitaphs. How cunning you were to discharge! Do you practice at the artillery yard? Trust a woman? Never, never! Bracciano be my precedent. We lay our souls to pawn to the devil for a little pleasure, and a woman makes the bill of sale. That ever man should marry. For one hypermnestra that saved her lord and husband, forty-nine of her sisters cut their husband's throat all in one night. There was a shoal of virtuous horse leeches. Here are two other instruments. Enter Lodovico Gasparo still disguised as Capuchins. Help! Help! What noise is that? Ha! False keys in the court. We have brought you a mask. A matakin, it seems, by your drawn swords. Churchmen turned revellers. Isabella! Isabella! Do you know us now? Lodovico and Gasparo! Yes, and that moor the duke gave pension to was the great duke of florence oh we are lost you shall not take justice forth from my hands oh let me kill her i'll cut my safety through your coats of steel fate's a spaniel we cannot beat it from us what remains now let all that do ill take this precedent man may his fate foresee but not prevent and of all axioms this shall win the prize. Tis better to be fortunate than wise. Bind him to the pillar. Oh, your gentle pity! I have seen a blackbird that would sooner fly to a man's bosom than to stay the gripe of the fierce sparrow-hawk. Your hope deceives you. If Florence be i' the court, would he would kill me. Fool! Princes give rewards with their own hands, but death or punishment by the hands of other. Sirrah, you once did strike me. I'll strike you under the centre. Thou'lt do it like a hangman, a base hangman, not like a noble fellow, for thou seest I cannot strike again. Dost laugh? Wouldst have me die as I was born in whining? Recommend yourself to heaven. No, I will carry mine own commendations thither. Oh, I could kill you forty times a day and used four years together twere too little nought grieves but that you are too few to feed the famine of our vengeance what dost think on nothing of nothing leave thy idle questions i am in the way to study a long silence to prate were idle i remember nothing there's nothing of so infinite vexation as man's own thoughts. O oh, thou glorious strumpet! Could I divide thy breath from this pure air when it leaves thy body, I would suck it up and breathe upon some dunghill. You, my deathsman, methinks thou dost not look horrid enough. Thou hast too good a face to be a hangman. If thou be, do thy office in right form. Fall down upon thy knees and ask forgiveness. Oh, thou hast been a most prodigious comet, but I'll cut off your train. Kill the moor first. You shall not kill her first. Behold my breast, I will be waited on in death. My servant shall never go before me. Are you so brave? Yes, I shall welcome death as princes do some great ambassadors. I'll meet thy weapon half-way. Thou dost tremble. Methinks fear should dissolve thee into air. Oh, thou art deceived. I am too true a woman. Conceit can never kill me. I'll tell thee what. I will not in my death shed one base tear. Or if look pale for want of blood, not fear. Thou art my task, black fury. I have blood, as red as either of theirs. Wilt drink some? Tis good for the falling sickness. I am proud. Death cannot alter my complexion, for I shall ne'er look pale. Strike, strike with a joint motion. <clears throat> they strike. Oh, Twas a manly blow. The next thou givest murder some sucking infant, 
and then thou wilt be famous. Oh! What blade is it? A Toledo or an English fox? I ever thought a cutler should distinguish the cause of my death rather than a doctor. Search my wound deeper. Tent it with the steel that made it. Oh, my greatest sin lay in my blood. Now my blood pays for it. Thou art a noble sister. I love thee now. If woman do breed man, she ought to teach him manhood. Fare thee well. No, many glorious women that are famed for masculine virtue have been vicious. Only a happier silence did betide them. She hath no faults who hath the art to hide them. My soul, like to a ship in a black storm, is driven. I know not whither. Then cast anchor. Prosperity doth bewitch men, seeming clear, but seas do laugh, show white when rocks are near. We cease to grieve, cease to be fortune's slaves, nay, cease to die by dying. Art thou gone, and thou so near the bottom? False report which says that women vie with the nine muses for nine tough, durable lives. I do not look who went before, nor who shall follow me. No, at myself I will begin the end. While we look up to heaven, we confound knowledge with knowledge. Oh, I am in a mist. Oh, happy they that never saw the court, nor ever knew great men but by report. Vittoria dies. I recover like a spent taper for a flash, and instantly go out. Let all that belong to great men remember the old wives' tradition, to be like the lions in the tower on Candlemas Day, to mourn if the sun shine, for fear of the pitiful remainder of winter to come. Tis well there's yet some goodness in my death. My life was a black charnel. I have caught an everlasting cold. I have lost my voice most irrecoverably. Farewell, glorious villains. This busy trade of life appears most vain, since rest breeds rest where all seek pain by pain. Let no harsh flattering bells resound my knell. Strike, thunder, and strike loud! To my farewell. Dies. Enter ambassadors and Giovanni. This way, this way, break open the doors, this way. Ah, are we betrayed? Why then, let's constantly all die together, and having finished this most noble deed, defy the worst of fate, nor fear to bleed. Keep back the prince, shoot, shoot. Oh, I am wounded. I fear I shall be ta'en. You bloody villains! By what authority have you committed this massacre? By thine. Mine? Yes, thy uncle, which is a part of thee, enjoined us to it. Thou knowest me, I am sure. I am Count Lodowick. And thy most noble uncle in disguise was last night in thy court. Ha! Yes, that moor thy father chose his pensioner. He turned murderer. Away with them to prison and to torture. All that have hands in this shall taste our justice as I hope heaven. Oh, I do glory yet that I can call this act mine own. For my part, the rack, the gallows, and the torturing wheel shall be but sound sleeps to me. Here's my rest. I limbed this night piece, and it was my best. Remove these bodies. See, my honoured lord, what use you ought make of their punishment. Let guilty men remember. Their black deeds do lean on crutches made of slender reeds. End of Act 5 End of The White Devil by John Webster